way the Africans refer to God is the totality of creation itself. Okay, the totality of creation itself means everything that exists, including you, makes up what is God in the African mind. You are nothing more than an aspect of God having your peculiar experiences as a part of the greater whole. The consciousness of that relationship that makes you spiritually aware. See, what the white man has done is dumb us down and he's cast God in his image so that we see God only in the context of a white man's possibilities. That's not an African notion of God. You've got to tell it often enough. They didn't know what they know now until somebody told it over and over again. Most all religion, religion is nothing but a path to understanding divinity. And divinity is nothing but a knowledge of cosmology and ecology and your relationship to it and this relationship to you. I mean, most human bodies break down to over 400 elements and minerals. Every one of those elements and minerals can be found in the rest of the cosmology and the rest of the ecology. So the you have diamond in you, you have gold in you, okay? You have manganese in you, you have iron in you, you have tungsten in you. You don't think the iron in you talk to the iron in the ground? Or let the manganese in you talk to the manganese in me? The only reason we don't understand because we embedded in white people's ignorance, you know? So we don't know how to make relationships no more. Even when it happens, when you meet a woman, like when you met your wife, something attracted you to her. It wasn't just her looks. It wasn't just desire for sex. Something, because there was a bunch of other women around who you could have been attracted to. Something attracted you to her and something attracted her to you. And that's what you've got to find. See, when you find that thing, that's when you find the God in you and you find the God in her. See, it's the God in you that recognize the God in your mate. And that's when you become one. Seek knowledge and then teach the knowledge you have. But be willing to learn and be willing to say the one thing I know is how much I don't know. And then open yourself up to know more than you knew before. We need to just learn how we are. We are old people. And it is likely that the civilization in the Nile Valley is not 5,000 years old. It may prove to be over 800,000 years old. With some new information that's come out about the age of the Sphinx. Well, if the Sphinx is 800,000 years old, just to get to the consciousness to build such a thing, you had to be around civilizing for a couple of hundred thousand years. And so we are an extraordinary people who've been here for an extraordinary long time doing some extraordinary thing. Now we're getting our behinds whipped because we've forgotten who we are. And we are busy trying to be the thing that is kicking our behinds. Now, the way to defeat our enemy is to stop being our enemy. Kill the enemy within and the enemy without dies. Is that easy. And that's why it's important to have the knowledge that we are trying to bring to one another, uh, me to you and you to me, um, every day. So we can grow, grow our families, grow our neighborhoods, grow our community, grow our nation, grow our race back to what it should be. Talk about the God, deity, and Kemet like they were white people having this conversation. They didn't talk about it that way. Language, Kemet. The language of Kemet is just like any other language in Africa. So what we are doing is kind of in error. We are calling these things gods. They did not. These are elements and forces of nature. Shu is the wind. Geb is the earth. Newt is the elements in the skies. They're not talking about gods. They're talking about integral aspect of the totality of divinity. And that each of these aspects has a function that makes up divinity. Divinity is every and all things at once, including you. And that's all they're saying. To understand this is to become wise. You know, not to understand this is to remain a slave. If you listen to my tapes, and you got to remember, I've been speaking for 50 years. Yes. I'm talking 5-0. I've been giving lectures and teaching for 50 years. Um, so I'm not new at this. Um, I've, I've walked with Dr. Ben, Dr. Clark, Dr. Carruthers, Dr. Hilliard. Before them, I walked with Kwame Ture and Rap Brown, uh, the Sakura brothers in the Black Panther Party. Before them, I walked with Adam Powell and Sunni Malik and Sonny Carson and Brother Willie Stocks. And so I've been out here like a long time, and I've been blessed by the ancestors and the gods that I'm still here. And if anything I got that's worth anything and that I can give to you, I'm giving 
Don't mean I don't make mistakes. I got a lot of stuff wrong, but I think I also got a lot of stuff right. I will make mistakes because I'm human. I have emotional response like you. I get pissed off like you. I get it wrong like you sometimes. But the one thing I will not do, I will not stand down nor stand back. And so years ago, I made this statement, maybe 30 years ago, that Judaism, Christianity, and Islam are mere fragments from the periphery of the African cultural and spiritual system. And so I'm still making that statement that Judaism, Christianity, and Islam are fragments from the periphery of the African spiritual and cultural system. And what I mean by fragments, these are religious form formations. Religion, the word means to bind back. And so you have to ask the question, what is it they're trying to bind back to? They're trying to bind back to a body of information that our ancestors put together learned from the universe on how to govern ourselves so we live together in a civilized social manner, okay? And that's what this is all about, and being able to control the economic politics and culture and the environment that we're in, and at the same time, being able to build for tomorrow, build for eternity, so our children and our grandchildren will have the uh, opportunity to advance their lives, provide food, clothing, shelter, and safety for themselves, live in a harmonious relationship with one another, and don't destroy the ecology and the environment that they were living in. That's what these religions and philosophies and stuff are supposed to be teaching the human being in terms of behavior. And so once we get that straight and understand what it is we're talking about and move away from the personality cults and move away from the worshiping of human beings as gods, and begin to understand that what we are trying to do is learn and implement principles in our daily lives, both in our personal lives, in our family life, in our extended family life, and our greater social and cultural lives. And once we get that clear, it's easy to look around and see what the fragments and pieces are. Once you've learned your history and you know how your whole body looks like, you'll know what a finger from your body looks like when you see it. You'll know what a foot from your body looks like when you see it. You'll know what a footprint from your body looks like when you see it. And so these other instruments of socialization that we call religion, a mere fragment, philosophical and ideological and spiritual fragments from the periphery of the African spiritual system. And so today I'm going to be looking at uh, just a, a, a more survey, it's not that in-depth, a history of Christianity in Africa before the transatlantic slave trade, actually before the Catholic Church, all right, um, which people think is the mother of the churches, and, and before the Eastern Orthodox Church. Before any of these churches existed, what we are now calling Christianity in terms of form and belief existed in Africa for many, many, many thousands of years. So when we try to look at this thing called Christianity in ancient Africa, remember the, the term Christianity is a new term. It, it got applied um, around the 10th century uh, A.D. Uh, prior to that, nobody called this thing Christianity. Um, even at the 10th century, it was just beginning to get called that. And it wouldn't, didn't catch on until much later. But what they were talking about was African metaphorical teachings about ideas, principles, and concepts of how human beings should live and relate to the universe and relate to the rest of the ecology and environment that we live in, how we learn from the universe, how we learn from that ecology, and how we learn from that environment, and what we do to create a future for ourselves as we reproduce ourselves as our children. So let's go into the slide. Let me make sure I got this working right. If I get to slide one, then I know we on. Okay, so we know we on. Now I put this one up because I wanted to show all of these symbols of religions. Whenever you go around the world, you see the Baha'i, you see the, the Buddhist and the Buddhist posture, you see the Buddhist wheel, you see the cross for Christianity, you see what they call the fish for Christianity, which is really uh, a symbol of a vagina which was used in, in the ancient um, Tigris-Euphrates 
system long before Christianity. We see the symbol for Confucianism. We see the symbol for the Judaic system, the Shinto Japanese system. Um, again, we see the, the Star of David or the Dog Star out of Kemet for the Judaic system. We see the Hindu system, Islamic system, the Sikh system. Everybody's system symbol for their system is there except the African symbol for their system. And I contend that the African symbol for what we are talking about that we call our spiritual system and our um, religion, the African symbol is a man, a woman, and a child. A man, a woman, and a child. Who we call in, in ancient Kemet, uh, Asar, Aset, and Haru. Who the whites have misunderstood, misrepresented, miscopied, called Jesus, Joseph, and Mary. And so that symbol of man and woman and child represent the continuity of life. You cannot have life unless you have two opposite sex that have an intercourse and a sperm and an egg is passed and you produce a replication of yourself, which is your eternity, because that is your future. And that must be constantly replicated in every generation in order for life to go on. And so that, as far as I can see, is the symbol that we projected to represent the greater part of how we understood reality. Now, if you look, now this is a, a writing system that's older than any other writing system in the world, except the ones down in ancient Sudan and in, in, in the, the Great Lakes area, which, out of which this one comes. And so, look here. The cross. Thousands of years before Christianity, there's the cross, which they claim they use as a symbol because of Jesus' dying. So just this one photograph shows that that whole concept is a fraud. So just to kind of get you started. So you can look with your eyes and see things, simple little things, you know, that people um, sort of like think... They can say it because we don't have any information. But once you get a little bit of information, you go like, oh, something's wrong with that picture. And then we come here, the pyramid text, the oldest written religious text in the world. At least the oldest written religious text known to the world because they just entered the great mount in Sudan, uh, the, the great temple mount in Sudan, and they found a whole nother set of writing there that precedes and predates these writings. And I'm pretty sure that they were religious writing. But to us to date, the oldest known text is this one in, the, in the, 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 the tomb of Eunice. But even here, it wasn't new. This was somebody repeating an older text. And so in this text, what the Europeans call the book of Genesis, much of the elements of what they call the book of Genesis is found in this text. Okay? And in this text, you find God saying, I created myself out of myself. I cause existence to exist so that I might exist. And then this God who is called Amun, the, the un, that which is unknown, then says, I hicker. And when he hicker, hicker means to vibrate. It means the same thing as the word. And I hicker and I produce others. So he produces pata. But look at pata now. No, first he produces ra. Now ra is symbolized by the sun. That means energy. And then he produced uh, Pata. Pata is symbolized by a mountain. That means matter. So now I've produced matter and energy. And he came into being out of Nun, which is water. So now you got water, you got matter and energy. And in, in Nun, the Nun out of which this God arrives is black and in darkness. So now you got darkness, but with Ra, you now got light. So out of the darkness into the light. So just like David looked at it later and said, let there be light. He says, I hicker and I created these. And then he said, I cough up Shu and I spat out Tefnut. Shu means the air. Tefnut means the moisture. And then Shu and Tefnut, which is, po is female and male, positive and negative, would produce Twins. Those twins would be called the earth and the skies or the heavens, Geb and Newt. And then Geb and Newt would then give birth to the first humans. Then we're talking about Asar, Aset, you know, uh, Set and Nephthys and on. So that Genesis story that they're using is our Genesis story. 
Okay? So that's what I mean when I say they are fragments from the periphery of our tradition. And then when God got through making everything, our God, meaning Amun, or whatever name we call him, Atum, whatever names are just descriptions of, of, of something, descriptions of characteristics of behavior. And then it says, having done all these things, having created all that my heart desired, I then expanded in it, which means everything that is, is also not only of me, but is me. So we are indeed, according to our tradition, God, the divine, having the human experience. Or more clearly put, we are expressions of aspects of the divine essence having the human experience. And this is what I was talking about. In the beginning, there's Nun, the primal waters, which one might even refer to as liquid matter. And then out of it would arise a tomb. And a tomb would be that unknowable factor that caused things to come into being. And then would arise a tomb ra, meaning the light, the energy, the radiation. And out of it, it would give uh, birth to, to Shu and Tefnut, air and moisture. And then the air and the moisture and the energy would then give birth to what we call the earth, all of the mineral resources that make up things, and newt the sky, meaning all of the elemental planets that's up there. And this, these will give birth to Nephthys, Osiris, Isis, and Set, who would then give birth to Ra, uh, Ra Hator, Horus, Anubis, and so forth, meaning the human beings would come forth from the elements of the earth and the energies of the sky. So... All of what we put forth in our creation story is what they would copy in their creation story. So when they talk about Ad Adam, Adoma, they're talking about Geb. They're talking about the earth. And when they're talking about Eve, they're really talking about Newt. The Adam means earth, ground, the, the minerals. And, and, and Eve means life, the energy force that come about as a result of the of of, of 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 the minerals in in this earth. But why so, is it so hard for our people to really understand that? It's a because that because this story. I know, but because we have to get familiar enough with it. I'm just getting familiar with it. I've been reading about this stuff for years, but I've been mm -hmm. glossing over because Dr. Ben was teaching us. I didn't need to know it. I just listened to Doc. Um, now I'm watching brothers like Brother Reggie and others who have mastered this body of information, and so I'm trying now to catch up with the youngsters. And trying to learn and understand this so I can explain it. Oh, yeah, I'm Roscoe, I'm some bad dude. So, so I'm trying now to, I always knew it instinctively, but now I'm trying to look at it in detail so I can tell those of you who are listening to me do the study, do it in details, and find out what each of these things mean. So they're not people, they're not gods walking around with animal heads. Those are metaphorical representation of ideas, principles, and concepts. Let me say that again. Osiris walking around as a mummy being dead. There's no dead dude walking around with his dicks pointing out. Um, that's a symbol of, of, a, of a concept and a principle that is alive in every human being. Osiris is every human being. A set is every female human being. You understand? The, the children, their children are their qualities and attributes. Anubis, Haru, and so forth. These are the quality and attributes of what every human being is capable of expressing. So let's, let's go on. Um, this, the Per M. Haru, the book of the coming forth by day, or what the whites call the Egyptian book of the dead. This is chapter 17. And I just I put this in because I wanted to show, you know, I'm in Prince Hall Masons. People always jump and say, oh, the Masons, this and this. Stop listening to the, your ideas about white masonry that you've learned from white folks who hate white masonry. Go do your own research and find out what masonry is all about and where did it come from. And this symbol right here with the lion, uh, leopards facing in different directions, this this is just the concept that symbolized yesterday and tomorrow. And the light in the center, Ra, represents today. You know, just, and th that symbol is at the center of the Freemasonic teachings, which come out of Kemet, not out of England, not out of France, not out of the Knights Templars. The Knights Templars and them steal this body of information from us and bring it back to Europe and repackage it like they've done Christianity, Judaism, and other things. 
This I put up, the Book of the Coming Forth by Day, is very important to see this little piece here. There's a lot in this papyrus. It's a fantastic papyrus. It has so much in it. But the little piece I was concerned with was to show you, brother, this is the papyrus of, An, uh, papyrus of Ani. Brother Ani has passed away. This is his soul, his ba, being uh, watching his spirit being weighed. This is the feather of ma'at, the feather of truth. This is his heart being weighed. His heart meaning his deeds, how he lived, how he spoke, how he acted, how he behaved on this earth, being weighed. The energy that that has produced is what is being weighed against a feather. And that feather had better be lighter, mean heavier, than the, at the energy that you produce on this earth. Because if you produce negative energy, it will be weighty. If you produce good energy, good character, good behavior, it would be light. And so you have Anubis, the, the, uh, the human body, and the jackal, the dog head. Now, there was no man in ancient Kemet that had a dog head. This is a symbol because the, the jackal was a dog that represents judgment. I mean, he would bury his meats in the ground and stuff and let it rot until it got just tender enough for him to go and dig up and eat and, and digest so it would do him some good. So he was referred to as the greatest symbol of judgment. So that's why he's using as the judge of the character of this man. And so here we've got this other person keeping a record, Tahuti. There's no person in the ancient came up with no bird head. There's a bird called the Ibis bird. And that bird, as it searched for worms in the marshland, it looks like it was writing. It leaves, if you see it today, it looks like they carry like they're writing a whole letter. So it became the symbol of how we carry on calligraphy or writing. And so the, the, the human is recording the result of this man's character being judged against the principles that the society calls ma'at. That is the standard by which everybody should behave. So, Professor, you see. Um, in looking at this and in listening to you, my brother, mm -hmm. we, as African people, we look towards nature to give us the answer to things. We also look right. at the signs of the animals that, yeah, that right. we learn from we, 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 the animals and we watch them. Right. You know? Na nature is not our enemy. That's The white man is at war with nature. The African is a part of nature. And that's why the white man is at war with the African. Nature is, and the cosmos is our dictionary, our encyclopedia, our Bible, our holy book. We imitate it because it is the perfection of creation so that we can be in tune with that perfectional function. And what the whites did, they would steal. And then this guy I got here, the hippopotamus, the lion, and the crocodile. Well, if you were on the bad side of things, you went here. This is probably what the white man calls hell, you know, in his, his literature. And, and, but I'm calling him now the district attorney. And I'm calling this brother the court recorder. And I'm calling this brother uh, the judge. And I'm calling, you know, the brother who's bringing Mr. Ani through his attorney. And what we're seeing up here is the 12 jurors sitting in judgment. And then what we see in the laws of Ma'at here is the laws by which people are being judged. So what I'm saying is that this is the American and the Western legal system stolen right from one page of our book, and they don't even give us credit for it. And it's right in front of our face, and we can't see it. They use our scale of justice. They use our lady Ma'at as justice. They use her bandana from around her head to put over her eyes. And, and we still don't get it. They've taken our whole system and make us think we don't have nothing. And they've got this great democracy and this great legal apparatus that we need to learn from when it's nothing but a fragment from the periphery of your system. The Coffin Text is the third oldest written holy book. Again, this is us, and I wanted people to be clear. Here are the priests and the priestess, and they're just black as they can be. So, Professor you know? Smalls, I'm sorry to keep cutting you off, but I want to yes, give sir. our people a good and clear sight. Mm -hmm. Where were the Hebrews? There, the, they, there was no such thing. They don't Where were the Moors? They, the there's no such thing. Okay. There was no Christianity, there's no Moors, there's no Hebrews, there's no Islam, there's none of this stuff. No, not at this time. No, not at this time. That's what I'm saying. Judaism, Christianity, and Islam is fragments from the periphery of this practice that we had going on 
hundreds of thousands of years before they stumble on the scene. They, they, they're nowhere in our history. They're nowhere to be found. And we have the best kept history in the world to date and the best preserved history in the world to date. And how would we not preserve something as extraordinary as the event they claim took place? So I try not to give too much credence to it other than to say that these people stole fragments from the periphery of this system. You see the priest with his leopard skin. You remember when I did Dr. Ben, I tried to simulate some right. leopard skin That's over my white true. robe. Yes. So, and here's the priestess with the leopard skin. And they're coming to, 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 to consecrate uh, the mummy, the symbol of the body having been dead and is now being preserved for posterity. And this is another page from the coffin text. So we have the pyramid text, we got the coffin text, um, we, we've got the book of the coming forth. Um, this is the 11th hour of the book of gates. This is the fourth oldest holy written books. Now these are all of our holy books written. There is no Bible yet, there is no Torah yet, there is no Quran yet. And here's all of these texts that we have written talking about life, talking about time. If you would count these, you would see we were already into the 24 hours. We were into the 12 hour cycle. We were already into the 365 uh, plus days of the year. We were already studying the stars, studying the relationship between the stars and other things here on earth, studying the relationship between man and energy from around the cosmos our interrelationship with life and death, we realized that there was no such thing as death, that we both matter and energy and neither can be destroyed. We knew that way back then. We knew that when we had our babies, that we did not have babies. We simply recreated ourselves as an extension of ourselves. So each child that comes out of a human being is that human being deposited themselves into the future. That's our culture. Again, an, uh, from the Book of Gates, another page. I just want to show we had these books. Another the second from the Book of Gates. I'm not going to go into the detail. And this, when we talk about the primordial waters of Nun, they use this symbol um, of a human being as water to symbolize the waters of Nun. The waters of Nun is, is, uh, is that thing out of which all things come into being. And in the Book of the Coming Forth by Day, our God, Creator Force, said, and having created everything in the world and having then um, deposited myself in everything, I then realized that I came forth from my mother, Nun. So the African Amun and Atum and Atum Re says that they came forth from a woman and that the woman or the feminine element in nature was the ultimate deity. I didn't say that. Our ancestors say that there's no book older on this subject than that. God Amun, the hidden one. There was no God looking like this, that had this little gold crown on. This is the conception of the mind of an African. If God was a human being, this is the way God would look, like them, okay? So this is the African projecting God in their image. So they said if God Amun was to be on earth as a human, this is the way God Amun would look. Woo. Awesome. And another... Uh, golden statue of the god Amun. God, what they call the, and I have the Antiar, that's Kut, Antiar, the Netter, which we call God, Netter God, uh, represent the darkness. Now, Kut was the opposite of boundless. Now, so, in, and these are just concepts in the character and the essence and nature of what we would call divinity. So first we know the, the divinity was in what we call darkness. And then we know that the divinity was boundless. It has no beginning. It has no end. It didn't start anywhere. It isn't going to end anywhere. So net, kut, and net, and, and kut, and, and, and um, the, this net, the boundless, was, the, was two of the most powerful elements of the divine as we thought them out. And this is the symbol of light, Ra, you know, represented by a human with a falcon head with the sun on top, but on top the sun is surrounded by a snake that, that has called itself in a circle, represent 360 degrees or infinity, meaning there is no beginning, there is no end. No, this, this, this is 
Heru Ra. Right, right. Okay, when you see this is Ra. So this is the symbol. The falcon is used because the falcon was a bird that can fly up into the sky. And it looked like it just disappeared into the sun. It looked like it just disappeared into the sun. Right, right. And the sun represented the source of an energy without which we would all die. Mm -hmm. So they were the symbols of the great divinity. And of course, this is the god Ptah. I love Ptah because his skin is always black. He got his little afro hanging up there, and, he, and he's my man. And Ptah is the architect of the universe. He represents the primordial hill, the matter, the things we use to build all the things that we build. So if you find in Freemasonry, they will always refer to secretly Ptah, but in the open, they call it the great architect of the universe. But once you get into the secrets, they'll tell you that this is Ptah. And all they're doing is talking about the concept of what is necessary to build that which will sustain the human family in an orderly way, in a civilized way, so that they can recreate themselves for posterity and for eternity. And this is a symbol of Shu and Tefnut. Shu represent air, which is a, a brother sitting on the throne with a feather, almost like Ma'at. And then Tefnut, who is a sister, symbolized by a lion with the energy and the power of Ra on her head. And so Shu and Tefnut, air and moisture, would then produce the earth. You know, the, the, again, this is our Tefnut, which is moisture and the wife of Shu. And they would produce they, Geb and Nut. Um, they would produce... Get, this should be reversed. Geb should be the earth, and Newt should be the sky. So that's my bad. Um, but remember, Geb is the earth. All the minerals, zinc, iron, uh, cobalt, all of the diamonds that go, all the, all the minerals that's in this earth is in the human body. You know, we're made up of all those minerals. And then the energy from all the stars in the skies and the sun is in our body. And we're made up of those in, the, the, the energy and those minerals make give us life. Before you go on. Yes. So family, let's correct it. Like, yeah. So the brother will tell you. Reverse it. Geb is at earth, the bottom. And Newt is at the top. So right. So y'all don't say brothers. Earlier, yeah. We only heal. We make right. mistakes. But <laughs> so, we correct it. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And this one, now we get into the concepts, principles, and ideas that we are familiar, more familiar with. Amen. And the first Madonna and child worship along the Nile. Aset, the Holy Mother, and Harud, the child born of Immaculate Conception, to Asar, the divinity. And you see sister sitting with her breast in her hand, where she's giving nutrient and nurturing to the child. And the third piece of this is the father, who is Asar. And that's why I'm saying the symbol of our divinity is the mother, child, father, or the mother, father, child. And it is this symbol that will become, throughout the Western world, the Mary Jesus symbol, the, the Madonna child symbol, and they will not make any reference back to this African symbol, which is a hundred and hundreds of thousands of years older than them. Matter of fact, on the 11th of September every year, this concept is celebrated in Ethiopia as the Ethiopian New Year. It is the biggest celebration in Ethiopia. And this is Asar. Look at them. This is the way we carved them back in the day. We knew we was black, so our God could only be black. This is the way we saw Asar looking. And he's carrying the shepherd's staff that later Christ would carry because this would become the Christ character in the Christian tradition. And this obelisk, which we see in Washington, D.C., a copy of it in Washington, D.C., is the symbol of this Tekanu, which in our metaphor, when he was killed, and lost his capacity to produce, that woman was able to cause him to get a hard on like granite stone. And he then was able to reproduce God itself. So it is saying that we, we never die. This is about no death. No death. And that all of what we call death is simply uh, uh, a spirit in transition always resurrecting itself. And this became the ultimate symbol of that resurrection. And of course, I love this one because it's the 12 divine disciples of God on earth or the original 12 disciples known as the Netaru. So before the, they took our symbols of Aset and Asar, Mary and Jesus, I mean Aset and Haru, Mary and Jesus, and then Asar as the Christ adult, 
then they gave him 12 disciples. Well, before that, we had the 12 disciples. Haru, Seth, Thor, Kanum, Hathor, Sebek, Ra, um, Amun, Ptah, um, Anubis, a seer, and a set. So here is the 12 disciples. And, and, and when you look at the, at the name of the 12 that they ascribe in their metaphor, because the story of Jesus is not a true story. That's a metaphor, a European Western metaphor based on your metaphor. This is us trying to explain nature to ourselves and how it functions in the laws. And each of these 12 qualities and attributes or multiple sets of quality and attributes in each one is present in the human character as a possibility of human development. And if you understand that that's what religion and spirituality is supposed to do is give you the tool to develop within your character any one of these multiple strengths that we call the netters. And they call disciples. The ancient Egyptians, of course, were black. And I put this picture up there because it's so beautiful. Um, with the sister with her locks. And they weren't called dreadlocks. Dread is a British word. The British didn't exist yet. The English language didn't exist yet. So they couldn't have been called dreadlock. Dread is a British word that means fear. And in Jamaica, where they encountered in other parts of the Caribbean, the priest class that was waging war of independence out of slavery, they all wore their hair in locks then as they do in Africa today. And the British said, we dread the lock-haired ones. And from that, we got the dreadlocks. You know, but it was the white man saying we dread the lockhead ones. But you can see the lockhead ones was there from the beginning of time. And of course, we didn't have no comb or brush. The hair would naturally dread. Or lock. Sorry. See how I made the same mistake? <laughs> so African Americans, we are nearly seven million people. All of us will not move anywhere. Most of us will not move anywhere. I don't think a ten percent of us will move anywhere. But what we need to do is to interact with our motherland, the richest continent on earth. We're sitting here wondering whether we should go to Africa. Well, the Chinese is there moving the riches out of Africa. We're sitting here wondering whether we should go to Africa. The Japanese is there exploiting and moving the wealth out of Africa. We're trying to figure out whether Africa is important. The American corporations are there extracting the gold, the diamond, the cobalt, the manganese, and the wealth out of Africa. No. We need to, Malcolm said, we didn't lose our name. What he said, he didn't lose your, your name. You lost your mind. Um, we've lost our mind. Africa is the richest place on earth. It is one of the most underdeveloped piece of real estate on the planet. You want to create a new nation? You want to create a new world? Go help them create that new nation. Help them create that new world where your grandkids and great grandkids can be born and grow up free. Why stay here just to complain about Jim Crow? Maybe this generation here won't go. But let's hope our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren say we want to build our corporation in Ghana, Nigeria, Cameroon, Togo. Okay? We want to raise our family in a community where people treat them like human beings. And you can walk your street without fear of being shot down by a stray bullet or beat to death by the law enforcement mechanism that's supposed to be protecting you and a government that won't act in your behalf. No, Africa offers us everything we say we want. And like I said, we know it's unrealistic to think that most people will move. But it is not unrealistic. It makes all the sense in the world that we begin to put our money where our mouth is, and we begin to invest our money where it makes sense. And Africa is the place where investment now makes sense. Not just the African-Americans, but the Africans from the diaspora. So Africans from the Caribbean, Africans from the United States, Africans from Canada. And this is a struggle that's been going on since Kwame Nkrumah 60 years ago uh, led the revolution that freed the country. And so when that happened, you know, you had people like Maya Angelou, you had people like um, Dr. Lee, you had people like W. Du Bois, you had people like, uh, oh God, any number, Julian Mayfield and other African-Americans who went to um, Ghana with Nkrumah to help build a new nation. Dr. Martin Luther King went there and was with him in 1967, something most people don't know. And when Dr. King returned from Ghana, 
1967, after the independence rally, he wrote a speech called The Birth of a New Nation, an extraordinary speech, which everybody should go online and get and read, because you'd forget about that habit, I have a dream, if you read this speech from 1967, after he returns from Africa. So the significance of giving the, the, um, the um, citizenship African-Americans, especially, and other Africans in the diaspora have been fighting for that for decades. And we have even fought with the African unions to get it, maybe give us a special African Union passport. Other nations have made offer, but nobody has done it. So Ghana has opened a door. Ghana has led the way and give citizenship without any pre-qualification other than the basics to formally enslave Africans and says you can be citizens in this land. The significance of that is that the door has been opened now for every other African nation to do the same thing. And I'm sure others are going to follow. And with that's going to come many African Americans who will be comfortable enough, especially those with large sums of capital, to begin to invest their capital in Africa to build the African infrastructure and develop those nations. That is the hope, that we would begin to develop a new relationship. So there's a possibility now not just to go and visit, but to become a part of that nation itself as one of its citizens and move our wealth from America, where we are treated like trash, to a place where we can live and be treated like human beings. And I think that's a great part of what the significance is. Now, this is a painting from the tomb of Ramses III in 1200 BCE. It shows that the Egyptian perceived themselves as black and represented themselves as such without possible confusion with the Indo-European and the Semites. This is a representation of the races in minute detail, which guarantees the realism of the colors throughout the entire history the Egyptian never dreamt of representing themselves by type B or D. This is B, the Asiatic type, and, and, and D, the, the, so, the European type. And this comes from the book by Shek Diop, Civilization of Barbarism, by Shek Diop on page 66. So the Egyptians saw themselves as black, and this is on the wall of the tomb, and they saw the rest of the Africans looking just like them, and it was just as them. They saw the Asiatic type or the Eurasian type looking like this, and they saw the European type looking like this, and they painted on the walls, and they left it there to this day, so let's not be confused anymore, wondering who was who and what was what. This is a scene, <coughs> excuse me, like that, yeah, I could use a little water. Um, this scene comes from the wall of a temple in the Sudan, and this predates the, um, what, what we call the, um, the dynastic period in Kemet. There's a kingdom in the Sudan called Karma. It is a civilization that, that loaned itself to the civilization that would expand and become Kemet. So before there was a Kemet in the north, there was this civilization already functioning for thousands, probably hundreds of thousands of years earlier in the south. You see the leopard skin across the arm symbolizing that this is a priest. They're bringing wealth and gold and, and symbols. You can see that we weren't just brown today. We were black then and brown then. We didn't get brown because of the white man. We were brown and black from the earliest time. The brownness came out of our blackness. And so we ought to be clear when we play with ourselves in these conversations about who we are. We need to learn more about the ancient civilization in Sudan. I'll be going to Sudan this summer. I'll be visiting Karma for about a week and the great temple Mount Jabril in, in the Sudan. Hopefully I can get some good photographs to come back with. Abydos. The oldest city of Upper Egypt, 5,000 to 3,100 B.C. Now, I put this enormous temple there because when this Abydos is built with these beautiful, powerful temples, mm -hmm. with these powerful pillows, there is no Greece yet. There is no Rome yet. There is no Ionic civilization. There is no Doric civilization. This is just the black folks being black folks doing a black thing about black folks. So we didn't borrow this concept of the pillar temple from the Greeks because there is no Greeks yet. And we didn't borrow this from the Romans because there was no Romans yet. None of them exist yet. They're still barbarians in the mountains and of the Caucasus Mountains and other parts of Europe. 
this I wanted to show the enormity of the Grand Temple or the Grand Lodge of Waset. Look at this thing. It starts here. This is one complex. You could take the Parthenon and fit it in here 20, 30 times. Yet they stick this little Parthenon, this little square with some pillows up on a hill. But this thing you can see is one block, two blocks, three blocks, four to five city blocks long, if not longer. And you can see it, did, it expanded beyond itself. If you can see, there's a small group of little pillars here. This is where the Greek built something, trying to build something after they conquered Kemet. And this little mess that they built fell down already. This is what our ancestors built thousands of years before they got there. You know, and all of this is a part of the complex. And then if you came out the front door and walked for a mile, you would get into the great Karnak temple, which is bigger, even bigger than this one. And the whole complex itself was called Ipet Isut, which was the university complex in which our people learned the seven liberal arts, which we had invented long before there was a white man. We invented the seven liberal arts. You know, that's reading, writing, geometry, arithmetic, rhetoric, um, music, and a missing one. But it, it'll come. So here we are. When this is built, there's no white man. There's no Greece. There's no England. There's no France. There's no Rome. There's no Christianity. None of this. There's no algebra, Judaism. There's, algebra? Uh, algebra is a part of it. No, but, yeah, and, it but, no but that's not one of the seven. Oh, okay. Algebra fits under arithmetic. Oh, okay. okay? So, but we already had algebra because if you go to the Rhine Mathematic Papyrus, you see we were, I think it's problem 16 or, or one of them said we were solving problems with two or more unknowns. And when you're dealing with solving a problem with two or more unknowns, you're talking about algebra. Of course, they would later, later name the concept after some Arab. This is another beautiful temple, uh, the Pharaoh Hatshepsut burial temple in Dar el Bahir. This is, temple is built right out of the mountain. You couldn't do this today. The engineering feat to carve this facility out of the side of this mountain is absolutely extraordinary. And the science and the math and the geometry and the trigonometry and the algebra that you would need to do this is enormous. And there's no computers. And with computers, they couldn't replicate this. And Sir, Sister Hatshepsut was not the first female pharaoh. She just became one of the most famous ones. Shosheng I of the 22nd dynasty is thought to be the biblical Shishak mentioned in the Book of Kings. And you can see this is a statue of him. They mentioned him in the Book of the Kings. You can see this is a young African pharaoh the leader of the greatest nation on earth at that time, the nation we call today Kemet. And this is Pharaoh Tahaka, son of Shabaka, succeeds in driving the Assyrian invaders out of Egypt. He's the only Pharaoh mentioned, I should say mentioned by name in the Bible. And this is Taharka mentioned in the book of Isaiah. And, 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 and in, the, in the Torah, in the book of Isaiah, they talk about a chronicling about this king named Taharka. And, and they have Isaiah, their prophet, referring to him to the other Israelites, that he is king of Egypt and all the world. Mm. That's in deep. The Bible. In the Bible, king of Egypt and all the world. And for the, the Israelite not to get in this path trying to play any guerrilla warfare with them because he was going to drive the Assyrian invaders out of the land and save the Israelis. The Israelites. They didn't call so themselves Israelites. People got to skip over that. Oh, they skip over anything that's black. <laughs> and as you can see, this is a young black man. He could be right there on 141st Street and 7th Avenue walking around. But then he was the pharaoh of Egypt. In Deuteronomy, on the fourth chapter 9 from the, the new international version of their Bible, it says, only be careful and watch yourself closely so that you do not forget the things your eyes have seen or let them fade from your heart as long as you live, meaning your history. That's the things your eyes have seen. Teach them to your children and to their children after them. So how dare these people tell us not to teach our history, not to teach black history, not to teach African history, when the very book they claim they're worshiping tell them to do just that. Now Canaan, the land that they call Palestine or Israel today, this is Canaan, the god El, and a Canaanite woman. Is that black enough for you? 
you know, and look at the God. Is he black enough for you? Now, this is the God of the Canaan people before the crackle, and, and, and they lie to us and tell us like they don't know who the Canaanites were. These some exile Hebrew musician relief from Nineveh, 678 B.C. I hope you can see it well enough that these are clearly African men with these nose and these lips, and they're wearing their hair in the locks. And then we go to the next one. These are ancient Hebrews being taken into captivity by the Assyrians from the palace wall at Sennacherib. And this is from 680 B.C. Again, you can see the, the Assyrians are white. They got long hair. And then you can see the, the Hebrew captives have nappy, round, little round, dotty hair. So, um, you know. That is a group of Africans. We can go into detail, but I think Brother Reggie and them have handled that very well. I'll leave that to um, Brother Polite. But I just wanted to show you the symbol that just like the Moors were black people, the Hebrews were black people, the nation of Kemet were black people, the nation of Karma were black people, and now crackers have begun to seep down into our land with their war machines, and we're getting captured. An Ethiopian Hebrew today living in, in, in Ethiopia, you can see how she looks. And this, this, I put this up, this is the Temple of Solomon that supposed this is only a, an artist's recreation of what this temple must have looked like. I put it up because these two pillows in front is the symbol of all Masonic lodges in the world. You will not walk in a Masonic lodge except that you walk between the two symbols. And I'm not supposed to be at liberty to tell you what the symbols are, but you can go on any good uh, research on, on the internet and find uh, Masonic lodges and see that they're replicated from these things. Now, this is the Queen Makeda, uh, or who they call the Queen of Sheba. This is one of the oldest pictures I can find. And wherever you find a picture of her, she's always painted as a black woman. The, this is the ruins, supposed to be the ruins of the Queen of Sheba, or the palace of Makeda in Ethiopia uh, that's being excavated. By now, they should be finished with the excavation. I did have the opportunity to visit this site and walk through this site. It's a massive site. Um, so, and it is good our people to begin to do the archaeological work necessary to excavate our ancient Learn. history. And then we need to study how to go into business. You know, how to develop a business plan once I come up with an idea for business. And today, again, that computer is magic because that computer will show you how to outline and work your business plan. And you can see other ways to get help. Um, be willing to save your money. Get on a plane and go visit one of these places for two weeks. See what is there. See what it, what it takes to buy land or to lease land. See what the, com the countries are offering for investment in their stock markets. Like Ghana hasn't lost a point in their stock market in 15 years because of the gold and the diamond that Ghana has. Ghana is paying 27% on the dollar, somewhere between 23 to 27 cents on the dollar at any given point. So you can just go over there and kind of leave a few hundred dollars, a few thousand dollars in the bank and be looking good next year, you know? But we don't think of Africa in that regards. But we need to begin to look at Africa in that way. What kind of... Um, Mineral can be invested in Africa. What kind of petroleum um, sector can be invested in Africa? What kind of agra? Africa have some of the sweetest and most beautiful pineapples in the world. Unfortunately, most of it rot on the ground because it doesn't have a marketplace abroad because to ship it is too cost effective and there's no factory there. So why don't we go and build a factory in, in Ghana, for instance, that processes pineapple juice and do can and bottle pineapples and make other pineapple products. The same thing with cashews. They got cashews just falling to the ground because there's enough market for it, nor the technology to get it to the marketplace. That's where black folks can come in. We have the wealth. Let's go and develop the cocoa market. White folks are walking out there with cocoa and, and there isn't a candy bar made in Africa. We need to turn that around. You know, let's process the chocolate in Africa and give millions of our people work, you know, and let's market the African chocolate, not the Hershey chocolate. Hershey chocolate come from Africa, but we market Hershey chocolate, you know. So um, one of the third largest products, for instance, coming out of Ghana is, is cocoa beans, you know, it's, it's gold, oil, diamonds, then cocoa beans, so the fourth. 
And cocoa may outdo diamonds, I think. And you can do that in almost any country in Africa. But it takes the courage and the self-respect to go and do the investigation and the research that we should do. Because everybody else in the world is there. Sometimes when you get on the plane, if you took Delta right now, most of the people that will be stepping off that plane will be Mormons, Jews, um, other white families um, coming there to, to, to uh, invest and exploit. And we sit around over here. You got to see who's getting off the plane. You know, if you want to save your ancestral land, you really love Mother Africa, it's got to be more than a conversation. It's got to become a part of your reality. It isn't that many problems it's that there is not the connection. For the, oh, same, for, the, for the same reason the African-Americans are not connected. It's the same reason the Africans from the continent and the African-Americans are not connected. The same reason the African from the Caribbean and the African from the continent are not connected. Because we are the product of the last, some of us, four centuries of enslavement by a very vicious genocidal process. And that didn't just happen off of the continent of Africa. It happened on the continent of Africa as well. They call it colonialism, but colonialism is nothing but a cute white name for slavery. And so slavery in Africa on the continent is just ending. In some places, it hasn't ended yet. So most brothers from the continent of Africa know absolutely nothing about slavery, absolutely nothing about us, absolutely nothing about the Middle Passage, absolutely nothing about Jim Crow. And so they know about America and it's wealthy and there's opportunity. So they come here seeking that. Then they get here and they discover there's millions of other Africans here who had another kind of experience, which I know nothing about. And in most cases, the, just, the State Department and the Department of Interior inform and instructs Africans from the continent not to associate with the African-American community. So if you go to the Midwest where many of the Somalias and Ethiopians are placed, they're placed in the white community. And there's government agency that's handled them, that helped them get jobs, that helped them get in schools. And part of this processing is don't integrate into the African-American community. That's real. And that's a big part of the problem. But there are many Africans who have ignored that and have come in and worked with us and become a partner and a part of the communities we live in for as much as those that don't. What we have to do is keep struggling around building organizations and building bridges organizationally between the varied communities to get rid of the ignorance. Because just like we don't know about our history, Africans from the continent know less about their history. They're still studying the same colonial curricula that they were studying 50 years ago when the British had its troops there and the French still have their troops there and the Portuguese had their troops there. Those curricula that they put in place where it demean and degrade Africans is the curricula that are still in place, just like we have over here. We have an anti-black curricula in most of American schools. They have an anti-African curricula in most African schools. Yeah, once someone asked the question, how did we fall? We came up against animals. We came up against people who came out of war cultures. We came up against people who didn't love human life, who didn't believe in the divineness of the human being. And for the, for the want of things, for the want of some gold, for the want of some wheat or barley, they were willing to murder human beings. So they came upon us with a war culture and the war machine with spears and arrows and swords, things we didn't yet have. We would get those things and go back at them, but we would never become as good a killers as they are because their value in human life versus our value in human life is completely different. And that's why they just came in and slaughtered men, women, and children. That was something we couldn't do. You know, in the war, even when, when um, Brother um, Ramses and Brother, um, mm, oh, the, the, the brother of, um, of Hatshepsut, uh, even when they took the war all the way back to Turkey, they gave them peace. It's okay. We done whipped your ass now. Stay home in your land with your people in peace. We're going to even give you some food and other things if you're hungry, and that's why you come to fight us. But we came up against a culture of murderers. We came up against a culture of rapists, a culture of barbarians. If there's a good book, um, Michael Bradley, um, The Iceman Inheritance, we must all read that book. Um, 
because he talks about who the white man really is. This is a guy, when he's in the cave doing the ice age, when the snow came and he couldn't find no food, he ate his women. He ate his women. And there's proof of this because the human bones, the female human bones found in the cave had female human teeth marks in them. So they ate the old women first, and when they ran out of old women, they ate the other women. That's why they were screwing each other in the butt to find pleasure instead of having pleasure out of the beauty of a female. And so when we're looking at a culture of animals, a culture of barbarians, they have cleaned up because they've learned so much from those things I showed you in our culture. They've learned so much from us on how to clean themselves, wash themselves, use soap, dress right. But that behavior, that hasn't changed. That's why he's still making nuclear bomb and neutron bomb and, and biological weapons and shooting us down in the street and killing our sisters in the prison and all these things. The same barbarian is still in the head. It just looks different today. That's why we lost. But we haven't lost. The degree to which we lost is the degree to which the fear have us wanting to be like them. The fear of them having us wanting to be like them. When we learn about our own history, when we learn about our own divinity, and we lose the fear of dying and lose the fear of them and stop wanting to be like them, they will die. They're only one-ninth of the world's population. They only live because we are sucking at their titties and have them sucking at ours. When we stop that process, they will die. Matter of fact, all white nations, America included, right now is at minus birth rate, meaning more of their people are dying from natural death than they can give natural birth to. That's why they have so many pills and machines and all kinds of giving these artificial birth, adopting and kidnapping other people's children to infuse their blood system with melanin to keep themselves going. But we need to just pull away. We need to stop trying to imitate them. Stop trying to be like them. We're going to be better murderers than them, better dope dealers than them, better profanity than them, better killers than them. Then how can we kill them if they have become us? And so that's what the spiritual warfare we are now is about. That's what this discussion is about, is that our spirituality should trump their barbarism. The ancient city of Aksum in Ethiopia, it is in this complex here that this thing that the, the so-called Hebrews call the Ark of the Covenant, which they can't produce for nobody, the Ethiopians said they can't produce it because we got it. And, and, and each of the Ethiopian temples is another um, picture of that same, the modern part of that temple. And this is a close-up of the temple where they say this Ark is being kept. There's a big electric fence around all of this, which we can't see in the photos and soldiers with machine guns and stuff that guards us. So they got something up in there that they're not letting the world into. Um, and in each of their temples, their, their churches, what they call their mother churches, they have a replica of that ark in the Holy of Holies, where only the priests can go. I put this here because we wanted to look at it again, re-familiarize re ourselves, especially because tomorrow is going to be Good Friday. And last week you had Palm Sunday. And next Sunday, you're going to have Easter. So this is the original African mother and child. This is the Ethiopian version of the black mother and child. And this is what we got coming out of Europe, the white mother and child, which have now been imposed on the whole world through the barrel of a gun. In the history of Christianity in ancient Africa, St. Catherine's Monastery in Egypt, which is south of Sinai, is 335 A.D., you remember, it's, it's 325 A.D. when they come up with the Bible, right? When they start writing the Bible, they really don't come up with it for another 70 years or so. So here's this monastery, which is already there, and they don't even have a Bible yet. So what's this about? What are they teaching then? So they're teaching the same comedic body of information, and they're breaking it down um, to fit this modern people that have now invaded our lands, via the invasion of, this, of the Hitsa, first the Hyksos, 1700 BC, and then the Hittites, and then following the Assyrians, and then that's following the Persians, and that's followed by the Greeks, and that's followed by the Romans. Well, none of them ever go back home after being defeated, so the remnants of these people are now in our land, and our elders and priests is trying to interpret our body of knowledge in a format to teach it to these invaders' children who are now being born and grown up in our land for centuries, you know. And then there's another great building, the ancient Coptic church. And the elders 
which is the eldest of all Christian church. Now, the ancient Coptic church today is headquartered in Egypt. And I'm going to show you something on the next slide that should help your mind understand. The ancient Coptic church came about when Constantine called the Nicene Conference and called many of the brothers who was teaching this African spiritual wisdom together that was now under the Roman uh, invasion and domination to try to put together a document that would be common for the entire Roman uh, um, uh, Empire. And that document turns out, comes out to be what we call the Bible today. And according to the Pope before this Pope, seven of the ten men writing that document were Africans. And so the Coptic Church, a brother named Arius and his followers, break away from that discussion in, in Nicaea that Constantine is having because they disagree with the notion that Jesus is the Son of God and born to the earth and God came down and walked as a man. They said that was ridiculous. They disagreed with that. Um, their concept was that all human beings have the potentiality of the divinity. And so they uh, escape and they go back, they make it back to Egypt. Arius, their leader, will be murdered later on, but the movement that becomes known as the Coptic Church continues till this day. Now this is the Coptic Church. Christ and his disciples being depicted as African. This is one of the oldest painting of Christ and his disciples anywhere in the world, and it is in the Coptic Museum in Cairo. So just spend a little minute marinating on that since this Easter thing is popping up. So here's how the Africans, before the Bible was even finished being written, depicted their teacher, who the West would later call the Christ, and depicted those who were the disciples of that teacher who would carry on his teachings. And this is in the museum the Coptic Museum in Cairo. You can go see it today. There is no white painting of Christ yet anywhere in the world. There's no white painting of the Last Supper of Disciples anywhere in the world for another 500 years. This is another picture from the Coptic Museum. This is the conception by righteous Anne. Anne is the most holy mother of the God, Saint Anna, the, is the mother of the Virgin Mary and was the youngest daughter of the priest Nathan from the Bethlehem, descended from the tribe of the Levites, you know. And the Levites, you know, of course, these are the people who were the priest class. And so in the African picture, there ain't no white version of Jesus yet anywhere in the world. In the Coptic Museum, this is Jesus, the black man with his fro, and this is his grandmama. Okay, Anne. And he's given, you know, giving her a hug. And this is how African is painting their metaphorical representation of their teacher, before the crackers take it and turn it into their thing. And you can go to uh, Cairo today, you can go to the Coptic Museum today, and you can see these paintings and many, many others. I thought this was such a beautiful scene. This is Ethiopian Christians um, celebrating, uh, I think, the spring, the coming of spring, which the West call Easter. And so I just thought it was such a beautiful piece, you know, them doing this, because when they're doing their thing, there is no Catholic Church yet. There is no Protestant Church yet. There's no Luther Reformation yet. You understand what I'm saying? There's no Methodist. There's no Baptist. There's no Episcopal. There's no Catholic. None of that stuff exists. And yet we are celebrating this tradition, which goes back to ancient Kemet. And the metaphor that's expressed by Haru and his mother, Aset, metaphorical mother said and father Asar, which comes from the pyramid text story of the beginning of fair creation. Election. But we know if America's not going to be fair with the 50 million of us that live here or 60 million of us that live here, why are they going to be fair with anybody in Africa? Yet our brothers and sisters in Africa think they got a special relationship with white people and there's something wrong with why we look at the murderers and the rapers and the enslavers and the way we look at them. So that's something that has to be corrected with a knowledge of history and a knowledge of your culture and a knowledge of self. Most brothers and sisters from the continent have very little knowledge of their history and very little knowledge of their culture, just like we on this side have very little knowledge of our history, very little knowledge of our culture. Well, Africa is some, is some, there's nothing complicated about it. It is the Americans' attempt to put military bases strategically all over Africa so that they can have their CIA and their military intelligence in place to intervene on the part of the American corporate structure 
who is there primarily, and the Israeli corporate structure, we must say, because you can't separate those two, that are in Africa primarily to exploit Africa of its natural resources. And so if you've got an American military presence like an AFRICOM, where your intelligence apparatus is, is all over the country, where you're, on, where you're training African people to be a part of your intelligence network, using money and status as the primary incentive, where you are putting your military people to train our military people and then putting in place on the leadership of African military people that is controlled by the American military intelligence. That's what AFRICOM is about, to militarily control Africa, to militarily ensure that the American corporate structure will be able to continue to exploit Africa unabated unabated. The classic example was the murder of Patrice Lumumba in the Congo and the putting in place of 30 years a tyrant like Joseph Mobutu and make him the president of that nation to exploit the nation to the point of the murder of something close to 30 million Africans and nobody say anything about it even today. America has now apologized for the murder of Patrice Lumumba you know but it was John Kennedy that gave the signal, and it was Eisenhower that set up the assassination. And we got Kennedy's picture all over our living room. So AFRICOM is simply an America's subversive attempt to militarily occupy the continent of Africa and put their military people in strategic positions so if they have to move on any particular government in Africa, they don't have to wait to bring people all the way from America or equipment to do so. This house is a part of the Underground Railroad. Whoa. It's over. Hold on. It's, Say it's, that a, again? it's a part of what we knew as the Underground Railroad. There was a number of houses in this region that was. Mm -hmm. This is on the route going up to Canada. Um, they tore where the parking lots you see out there, then they tore most of them down. Um, there was an effort by my cousin, uh, attorney Sheila Small, and others who fought to save this one. And so it's ironic that I ended up living in it. Um, I knew this house when it was in a forest with nothing but trees around it and it was falling apart. Um, and the police used to use it to train their dogs to sniff out drugs and other stuff like that. Um, but the, this was a large black community. There's an AME church um, across town that was built in the early 1800s. So that's how long black folks have been up here. Um, we didn't just stop moving up here last year to get to the suburb. They've been a budding black community here in New Rochelle for a couple of hundred years. Um, New Rochelle is five minutes out of the Bronx, you know. Um, just a uh, 10 minutes drive down, you in one of the largest black dominated city in Westchester, Mount Vernon, where 75% of the population is black. Uh, if we go to the West, we get into the largest black population in Westchester County, Yonkers, New York. So there's always been this kind of myth where they only wanted to define the black population as being restricted to the urban inner city or what they chose to put together as so-called ghettos. But there have always been blacks who lived out here on these farms and in the uh, suburban and the farm areas that became suburban areas for centuries. And so this community we are in right here is called Rochelle Park. It's re you can see it's right in downtown. Our home stood on an acre of land right in the middle of the town. Um, and so there's the other 75 homes around me. And out of the 75 homes, 50 plus are owned by black families. Um, so a lot of the myth people give about us and where we live is just myth, myth, mythology. Um, this is a nice home for us. We have eight children and we have 22 grandchildren. So this is the perfect nest for them. Um, and they come and go all the time. I have three grandchildren. We had six living with us along with their parents. Um, two of them are off the college, well, three in college, but one live right here at home. Um, and the other three is here. We have other children who come and go depending on their situation. <laughs> you know, things may be rough one day and they need to come hang out home for six months while they find a new job or do whatever else. That's what home and house should be about, you know. There was only one black church during the time of slavery. Well, really two. The African Methodist Episcopal Church and then the African, what it was called, the, the, the Zion Methodist Episcopal Church. 
Okay. That was uh, the two brothers from Philadelphia, um, Absalom Jones and Richard Allen, who broke the way from the white Methodist church, a method or Episcopal church. And most black churches, as the other church is called the African Baptist church, but you'll only find the African Baptist church, which is older than the AME church, by the way. The African Baptist Church, you don't hear much about because it's rooted in the South and it didn't have the wealth of the AME Church, which was rooted in the North. And so those three churches existed during slavery, but very few enslaved Africans went to any churches at all, let alone a black church. Near the end of slavery, they started getting black people to go to the white churches. You either sit in the pew in the back or someplace like that or upstairs. But And then they began to open small churches for black people on the plantations. But there'd have to be a white preacher or a white overseer sitting in there to see what was being said. So um, there wasn't a lot of that. It wasn't until after slavery that you had this explosion of black church to take place. See, and then that explosion of black church um, gave us a place where we could organize and gave us a place where we could um, recreate the African village, which we had kept and retained in our heads. So the preacher became the, the chief of the village. The deacons became the council of elders. The church mothers became the queen mothers. Even the rituals in the church mimicked the rituals in the African village, like all African villages had an age group um, process where everybody 13 this year was processed into going through the rites of passage to become adults. Okay. In the Baptist churches in the South, everybody was 13 in any given year was round up and brought into the church and tutored to come into the church as a member. And you had to go on something called the morning bench where you sat on your knees at this bench, either with blindfolds on or with your eyes closed, and you went to a ritual very much like the ritual you would go to today if you were initiated into the Yoruba or the Akan. And you had to get, they said, a Holy Ghost. In Africa, they said you have to become possessed. Okay, so these are not in white churches. These are African rituals in the black church. So the church became the African village. After the 1950s, then we began to get a lot of these trained, theologian trained by white people, trained in white institutions, coming and taking the church over, and the church became a business for them and their families and not an instrument to politically organize and train. One of the things the church did between slavery and the 1950s, the end of slavery in this country in the 1950s, the church provided the basic training. We couldn't go to no college. Very few colleges was opening. So the church was the one where people went to learn church and the lodge. And the lodge, Prince Hall and the churches, was in full partnership. And so this is where you went to learn secretarial skills. You learn how to sew. You learn to be a carpenter. You learn to be a plumber. You learn to be a brick mason. All of the critical crafts that we were using in our community at that time, learning bookkeeping um, and that sort of thing. These things you learned in those days through your church and through your lodge. So that's the kind of role the church was playing. It was the churches that was establishing the credit unions that became the first black banks. Well, most of the churches in this country, the, quote unquote, right, new world. the churches in this hemisphere, North America, were structured based on the model of the churches coming out of Europe, particularly England and France. Christianity though, is a phenomenon that develops in Africa. Before you get the Catholic Church, there was already a thousand years of the Christian Church in Africa, in the Sudan, in Egypt, in Ethiopia, um, in the areas that we call Somalia, in in North Africa, in what is now what was then Old Carthage. Carthage was a Christian uh, enclave. And a lot of the old churches are still there. So the, the, the Romans would develop their Roman Catholic church based on an African church that was being modeled um, in what they call today the Eastern Orthodox. The Eastern Orthodox churches is the first white modeling on this African phenomena that we didn't call Christianity at that time, but they would call it Christianity later. And so when Africans came to this country, many of them came from those areas where Christianity was not an unfamiliar thing to them. The method of worship was different. 
but the, the, the basic theology was similar. So if you look at the Ethiopian church today, look at the, the Egyptian Coptic church today, and then look at the Roman Catholic church and the British church, then you'll see the difference. You see? And so many Africans who came over here were already Christians. Many who came over here was already Muslims. Most who came was in our traditional religious structure that gave birth to Christianity and Islam. It was the traditional structure, the structure we call voodoo. That's the structure that gave birth to Christianity. It gave birth to, to, to Judaism. It gave birth to Islam. I'm, I'm, I'm glad Donald Trump is the president of the United States. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. You know? Hold on, Smalls. Let me I'm tell you, on you for that, and I can bang back, and I'm a bigger banger than most now, people out there. Why are you glad that Donald Trump is the president? Because would you want the Zionist Jewish harlot whose husband put into place minimum sentencing act that put more of our brothers in the penitentiary than was put on the slave ship? Would you have want into the presidency the wife of the man who worked with Oliver North and General Secord to bring the cocaine into Arkansas at the National Guard Air Base that became the crack cocaine that caused the death of all those hundreds of thousands of our brothers and sisters? Would you have want in the presidency the woman who orchestrated the murder of Muammar Gaddafi and the destruction of Libya and set Africa back about 50 years in terms of its unity? Would you have want into place the people who run, what's that program, that killed more babies uh, in our bellies from abortions than was killed in the Middle Passage? No, I wouldn't. So I'll take this little cracker man and I'll deal with him right. like we deal with the other 43 cracker men that has been the president of the United States. He ain't nothing new. All right. And for those black elected officials and we ain't going to talk to him, we ain't going to sit to him. Let me tell you what's going to happen. He's the president for the next four years. Everybody else going to be at that table sitting with him and getting what they can for their people. You better get your black ass down there, too, or get the hell out of Washington and let us send some of these young brothers and sisters down to represent our people who know how to sit with a Donald Trump without being afraid of him and get from Trump where they got to get and bring back to our community. That's why I said what I said the way I said it. Really? You know, is this freedom or death? You know, simple as that. I really don't like that. <laughs> <laughs> let me see what Larry said. Oh. Um, now, you know the Jews cover all bets. Yes. son-in-law is Jewish. Yes. And still in right. the house. Right, right. Larry just said no, that. His son-in-law is Jewish, and his, son, his future daughter-in-law is Jewish, and even the one that's gone is Jewish. But then we have to learn history to know the difference between the Jew and the Jew. You know? Learn to start. Read a book called The Transfer Agreement by Black. It's about those Jews who killed the other Jews in Hitler's Germany, and we ain't going to deal with that no more today because they people then get all confused. Yes, but there's a bunch of wasps and other banking interests. See, this is a fight between banking interests. Trump represents one group of bankers. Hillary represents another group of bankers. It's just that the group that Hillary represents has been carrying us by our testicles using a rope called the Democratic Party for the last how many decades. Look at the conditions of our community under them. You know, Didn't Hillary so, go up in Haiti and um, robbed them of that? Oh, that what Hillary and her husband did in Haiti should be a crime against humanity, and both of them should be in the penitentiary. Yeah. But it ain't just Hillary. And, she was just the representative of a particular group, the same group that controlled the teachers' union that's messing but up our if children. If he's an enemy that's willing to let me take my piece of the pie and go about my business, that's cool. I don't want to mix with no Trump, you know. He a cracker just like other crackers. They have a history of killing us. Hillary, too. But I'm saying there's, there's organizations that's controlling our community and won't let us control it. And a big part of those organizations is controlled by the people who control the Democratic Party, those people who control the Charlie Rangel and who control the David Dinkins, those people who, um, you know, put us in a position when, yeah, when they kicked um, our... Um, Adam Clayton Powell out of the office, those people who worked with Tammany Hall and La Cosa Nostra to make sure we couldn't run our own community of Harlem and Bed-Stuy, that's who she represent. And she represent them in Chicago and L.A. and Frisco and Oakland and Atlanta. And yes, so 
Trump represent another group of thugs. I'm just deciding which group of thugs I can have a better relationship with in terms of getting what I need to bring back to my Harlem and not have somebody control me and they, and tell me that I can't even sing uh, the music they didn't want me to sing. The group she with, they're the ones that told Teddy Riley that you can't sing rhythm and blues. Either you do rap or your stuff won't leave the warehouse. So Teddy had to broke up Black Street just to get free of them. They're the ones that kill Sam Cooke. They're the ones that control black music the way they do. They're the ones that brought gangster rap in and in, in, in a filthy way and destroyed the real rap movement that was a liberation movement. That's who I'm talking about. And research what I'm saying. Go and do your due diligence, but I'm trying to give you enough information about Christianity before the white man stole it from us. Now, we didn't call this Christianity then. This was just our culture. It was just our spiritual way of being, and the stories were just our metaphor to teach our concepts, ideas, and principles to ourselves. So let's come back to this, because this is an important building. I had an opportunity to visit this building and go in this building. It's called St. Mary of Zion Church. It's the oldest church in Ethiopia, one of the 10 oldest churches in the world. Okay? The Crackers ain't got no church in England yet. France, Germany, Spain, none of that stuff yet. Italy, no churches yet. And this is the church of St. Mary of Zion, the oldest church in Ethiopia, is one of the 10th oldest churches in the world. And it's there because when Christianity is not an Ethiopian phenomenon, this brand of it, what we know as the Benzantian Empire, those part, that part of the Roman Empire, who took the work that was initially done um, by the people at the Nicaea Conference, the Nicene Conference, and they established what we know today as the Eastern Church or the Eastern Orthodox Church. And that church then was part of what was called the Benzantian Empire. That was the Roman Empire once it became Christianized, but it wasn't called Christianity yet. Okay? And so one of their leaders coming down the, Nile, the Red Sea, the king boat sank and the king died, and his son was rescued by the Ethiopians and raised for some years by the king of Ethiopia along with the prince of Ethiopia. When the boy got old enough and returned back to what is now Turkey, but was then Benzantian, and he then introduced, reintroduced this religious form to his friend, who the prince of Egypt, who was now the king of Egypt, as he was now the king of the Benzantian Empire. And that's how this church in this form got started in Ethiopia. But even at this point, as, as it's being developed as the early Christian church, there is no Roman Catholic church yet. The Roman Catholic church would emanate out of this church. Okay? And I'll show you that on a graph in a few minutes. But what makes this church important, the queen mothers of Ethiopia says, no, this is not our form of how we look at our culture spiritually. This is a foreign way of looking at the culture. So they burnt all the churches in Ethiopia down. And this was the only one that was saved by the king. And so that's what makes it significant. So till this day, they don't allow any women to enter this church because the women burnt it down. But as a male, I was allowed to go into the church. And that's when I saw a sixth century painting of the Madonna and child, black and as beautiful as can be. The Madonna is wearing, is wearing a blue dress with gold trim. The child is wearing white with gold trim. And it was a, a tapestry over six feet tall from the 6th century. Michelangelo, great-grandmama, wasn't born yet. And he paints the first one in Europe. This is a 5th century Benzantian church foundation in Ethiopia. So if you're talking the 5th century, the Catholic church don't exist yet now. You all understand me? So you'll understand what I'm talking about with Christianity in Africa before it's in Europe. But we have a different form. And if you go look at what's going on in Ethiopia, there's nothing in Europe that resembles what's going on in Ethiopia. And after the Benzantian Empire falls, the Ethiopians will fall under the leadership of the, of the Egyptian Coptic Church and will stay under the Coptic Church until the 20th century. When under Haile Selassie, they will establish their own, or under Menelik, they begin to establish their own bishop in partnership with the prelate from uh, Egypt, and then under Selassie, they will establish their own autonomy from the Coptic Church of, of Egypt. This debris, uh, Ber Berhan Selassie Church in Gondor, Ethiopia. I got to visit this beautiful church. And the, 
Their metaphor and stories are painted from the floor to the ceiling. Every inch of the church is painted in the story of their belief system. And all of what they interpret as the Bible, which is a different interpretation than what we interpret, is on the ceiling and the wall. This is their hieroglyph. Okay. And all the churches, they have this. It's just magnificent, especially all the old ones. And this is how we carved the churches right out of the side of the mountain, our place of worship. Because we didn't call the churches, because church is an English word that simply means community of believers in God. It doesn't mean that building. The church is, I think it's a Greek word, it means community of believers. Okay. And this one, this is the church of St. George in Lalibela, Ethiopia. When the queen mothers burnt down all of the churches around Ethiopia, the king moved his kingdom up into the mountain, a place called Lalibela, where there was only one small pass into the kingdom. Even today, you could only get up there on this one small narrow road. And so he then built these churches down in the ground, carved out of solid rock, so it wouldn't be seen. And thus, they would have an opportunity to rebuild. He built 11 of them, I think, or 12, before uh, you know, anybody could come in and burn them down and break them down. And that's how Lolly Bella came about. It wasn't that they were trying some great engineering feat. This was out of necessity. How do we create these places of worship without having it burned down to the ground by our traditional leaders? And this is it from the sky. I've been down in here. It's magnificent. You walk through this pathway in the rocks. You go down some steps and you come out this door right here and you go inside and it is an absolute temple and cathedral in there. Just carved out of a solid piece of rock. Oh, they built that like down in the ground. They didn't build it. They right. just, they, just go they didn't build it. They just See? carved it. Right. See how they that's carved that? That's right. They carved wow. it right out of the rock. That's one of 11. They got 11, 12 of them. Down in the earth. Down in the earth out of solid rock. You know, that's, this is one piece. Okay. And they carved out the inside. So it's, it's look like any other cathedral. Uh -huh. Carved out the windows and the doors. You know, it's magnificent. You got to go there. And this is another one in the mountains, in the side of the mountains. Just to show you off it. This is Sixth Century Castle at Gondor, Ethiopia. I just thought I'd throw this in so we know that we didn't learn how to build castles from England and Robin Hood and, and, and the, and the 40 Thieves or King Arthur. They learned it from us. Okay. These are other castles in Ethiopia that predates any other castles in England. So when they start talking about their castles and stuff, we know where they got it from. And this is Hathor Temple at Naga, Sudan, 2000 BC. And I'm going there to Hathor because when we think of Hathor, Again, you got to start thinking of Mary, you know, the symbol that becomes Mary in the Christian tradition. Then we go to this place called Old Dungalo, 11th century A.D., Christian community. This is what important, it's important there. This is the church of the granite column at Old Gondola, Sudan, in East Africa. Now, Sudan was one of the biggest Christian community before the Muslims invaded and destroyed most of the churches. But Africans are excavating their temples that predated the Islamic mosque. Um, so that they can restore their history. Hopefully I can make it there this summer when I go into Sudan. This is the remains of an 11th century church at Bagnati, Sudan. Look at the enormity. They're just excavating this thing. This is 11th century. Look at the enormity of these pillows and what must have been above ground that these things were holding up. There is no transatlantic slave trade yet, right? Islam is just developing hundreds of miles away, but have not invaded our lands yet. And so the, the Catholic Church has just come into being, so we ain't talking Catholicism. That ain't what this is, all right? This is our version of what they will call Christianity. And this is the Benzantian, I just said, early Russia. I just kind of want you to see that there was something going on. While we're down in Africa doing our thing, you have the German invasions coming into Europe. And the German invasion starts way over here in the Caucasus Mountain, you know, and, and these are known as the Ostrogoth and the Visigoth. They will go all the way through Spain, invade North Africa, attacking the Roman Empire. Okay. This is before the Muslims come. This is before the brothers who history we're talking about as the Moorish Empire would rise. These German crackers would invade at North Africa, and many of them still have their remnants living there until this day. 
That's after the Romans had sat on us for hundreds of years in North Africa and had again bastardized our people in North Africa, people we call in Arabs and so forth today. And so I just want, while we are, and this is the 11th century, you got trade from Western Rome and trade from the Middle East, India, and China. You got, this is what this whole thing is about with white folks. It's not about religion. It's about capturing these trade routes so that they can make money to build their empires in the same way we saw these murderers in Brussels who just had a bad day a few days ago who killed 25 million Congolese and helped to murder Patrice Lumumba and now they're crying because the chickens have come home to roost in Brussels. Well, Brussels was built off of the blood of murdered Africans. So the chickens have come home to roost and we need to understand what that's all about. Now this chart I want to take a minute with because I want to show you I don't have a pointer and I do my arm, I do have a bad arm, but I want to show you something. 33 BC is about the time, AD is about the time they said that this person called Christ died, right? 325 AD is when Constantine starts the uh, call for the Nicene Conference to start writing the Bible. It would take from 325 AD to 789 before you get a Bible. I hope you all are listening to me. From 325 A.D. to 787 before you get a Bible. So all the African churches are operating. They are not operating out of this Bible. We only reference them as Christianity, but they're not called Christianity. This form that they're calling Christianity is what they copied from us. And so this period is called the seven great councils. The first one is called the Nicene Conference, the first Nicene Conference. Then you had the second Nicene Conference. Then you had the Conference of Trent. Then you had the second Council of Trent. And then you had three more conferences before in 787 you produce what is known as the Bible. And it isn't until 1054. Now Ethiopia has got churches all the way back there in the third century, the fifth century and so forth. You don't get until 1054 the Roman Catholic Church. You understand what I'm saying? And now the unchanged Orthodox Church, these are the ones that comes out of what we are now calling the Coptic Church uh, and, and part of what is being discussed at Nicaea over that period of time. And so the Catholic Church will come into being at 1054. And then they will begin immediately. As soon as they, 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 they adopt our information, the first thing the crackers do is put together armies, 1139, a little more than 100 years, they put together armies to invade the so-called Middle East, Northeast Africa, and call these armies the Crusaders. The minute we give them some information, they flip that and come with their war machine. And so it isn't until the 15th century that we get the Reformation of Martin Luther that produced the Baptist Church, the Methodist Church, the Episcopal Church, and the Anglican Church. So they don't come about until the 15th century. All this time, Africans already practice in this tradition they call Christianity. You understand me? Mm -hmm. Okay. And so by 1517, you see what is called the Reformation. You know, that's, 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 that's Luther coming about and stuff. And then, of course, Henry of England uh, severed ties with the Roman Church and created around 1529 what is known as the Anglican Church, out of which comes the Episcopalian Church. So... Understand me, people, you can go and find these things online, but I'm at least opening the door for your research so you can begin to enlighten yourself to see how people have been bamboozling us. See, we don't understand what we're doing. If we aspire to be like these people, you aspire to be in partnership with murder. You aspire to be in partnership with thievery. You aspire to be in partnership with people who do not respect the elders. They can't wait for them to get in the nursing home and leave them there to die. You aspire to be in partnership with people who feel that their children isn't worth nothing to them other than what they could produce for them. You aspire to deal with people who, when a member of the family gets sick, they put them away and forget about them. You aspire to be with people who would go to any length to take the, the raw material, the land, the labor of another person without thinking a second thought. If we keep on the course that we started on with the so-called civil rights movement, it would be the same if, if 
Jesus, so many of you believe in that personality when it went to the Garden of Gethsemane, when it went to pray, and when he was tempted by the devil, it'd be the same as if Jesus says, okay, Satan, I'm going to follow you. I'm going to integrate with you, Satan. I'm going to become a partner with you in your deeds so that everything will be all right and I don't have to have the hardship that comes with opposing what you're about. See, most of us, I got no problem with people who say they are Christians if they are doing what Christ did. I have no problem with people who say they're Muslim if they're doing what Muhammad did. I have no problem with people who say they're Israelite, Hebrews, or Jews if they're doing what the Maccabee family did. I got a problem with hypocrisy even if it's out of ignorance. And that's where we're at. There's no reason for the second largest group. Do you realize that the African Americans is second in size only to the white Anglo-Saxon Protestant in the United States? Do y'all realize that? They keep calling us a minority, minority. Everybody else is a minority except us and the white Anglo-Saxon Protestant. And we are only a minority to the white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, maybe. Maybe. Because his ranks are so filled now with Jews and Catholics and Poles and everything else, he lost his white Anglo-Saxon Protestantness a long time ago. We may well be singularly the largest ethnic group in America. But we have accepted our enemies calling us minorities and we have accepted acting out the role of some weak, wimpy minority. Even though we spend as a community nearly $400 billion a year making us the sixth or fifth largest nation in the world economically and don't have a damn thing to show for it except some clothes which we got to discard in a few years to buy more or a raggedy piece of an automobile which you could have done well just to have kept the last one and keep it in running shape or a bunch of cheap furniture that you're going to exchange four and five times in your lifetime in the same living room and dining room because you forgot what the furniture was for you thought it was there for people to look at and not there to be used in a certain way this is not just Philly, this is all of African America I'm talking about. This is our situation. Even when we get the most intellectual training the white man got to offer, we get on TV and talk about the size of each other's penis and the, the so forth and so on, like Brother Hill and Sister Thomas, or Sister Hill and Brother Thomas did. They were the cream of the crop. They did exactly what the civil rights movement said you should do. That's right. They integrated. That's right. The brother got so integrated, he integrated the bedroom. That's right. He heard Dr. King when he called for little black boys and little white girls to play together, and he went to playing. <laughs> and never stopped. Right? They integrated. They got PhDs. They got law degrees. They worked for the finest firms. They got to the top of the corporate ladders. They did everything. They said, if you integrated, you could be. And all we had was some scum sitting on public television acting like ill-mannered, Ill ill-moral, moral, unethical idiots. That's what we had. Instead of having some proud, strong back. clear, African-thinking people We ended up with the best of the crop. And see, you can't put Thomas Donald say he was conservative. I'm the, one of the most conservative people you're going to run into. I'm very conservative. I don't understand what people mean when they say you're conservative, you're liberal. I'm a conservative. Any African who isn't a conservative is a fool. What is it you got to be liberal about or to be liberal with? You've been liberal with your freedom, giving it to the Jews. Jews own you. You've been liberal with your property. The Jews done bought it from you or stole it from you. You've been liberal with the best of your male crop. The Jewish women got them. You've been liberal with the best of your female crop. The Jewish men got them too. We've been liberal with everything. And that's why we're in the situation we're in. We better learn how to conserve what's ours. We need to learn how to become very conservative. 
we need to think of the time when we were doing good. And if you check out that time, it's when we were very conservative. See, conservatism for white people mean one thing. Conservatism for us should mean something else. White people want to conserve white supremacy. I want to conserve the point in history when Africans had freedom. I want to conserve the notion of our freedom. I want to conserve the way of our ancestors. I can't be comfortable talking about Jesus or talking about Muhammad or talking about Moses or any of those things when I know that man is 25 million years old and I know that paleontology, anthropology, and archaeology puts him in Africa. I know that Homo sapiens sapiens is at least five plus million years old and he's also or she's also in Africa. When I know they've done the mitochondria DNA test more than once and proved that all species in the world of the human come from one black woman. And if we've been around that long and we don't get a whiff of Abraham until 1700 BC, what the hell is all that little fairy tale and mythology is all about that's got us so confused and hating each other and misusing each other? A story told in times too recent to take serious and we've made it the, the point at which we determine whether we live or die and we've killed in the name of it. You've been arguing over the directions you gave to the psychotic member of the family in order that they might function with some sanity and now he kicked your butt and made you act as psychotic as he is and then he gives you the same thing. You're still going to be crazy. And if you think what we are allowing isn't that of an insane person, then you'll need to examine yourself and get real. There's nobody in this room more beautiful than anybody else, except in the minds of some backwards person. There's nobody in this room more ugly than anybody else, except if their deeds paint them so. There's nobody in this room that is more valuable than anybody else, because when I cut off the oxygen for both of them, Death is what's going to meet both of them, no matter how valuable they think they are. Equality isn't something we have to fight for. We should simply fight for the right to be right. Fight for the right to be right. And every one of the religions we use, it says, know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. It tells you truth alone will set you free. Yet the truth is the one thing you can't bring even to your family when you get it, and the truth has to do with Africa. Even your mother will reject you out of hand. But then we'll go right out the door and profess in the name of Christ, know the truth, and surely you should be free. And I say, oh, my, we're African. Get the hell out of here, boy, with that foolishness. <laughs> They've taught us to just stay and let people keep killing us. Police come in our neighborhood and kill us. We get into church and cry. And oh, oh Lord, not once do we get up and just say, Gee, give me the strength to kill the son of a bitch. Not once. I've been to enough funerals. Not once. They took the best I had. They took my baby, Lord. Okay, go kill the cop. Go kill the cop and see how many babies they won't take no more because they'll think somebody else, mama, coming to kill them. But then I made y'all so scared to go before God that y'all want to live forever in this form. <laughs> ain't none of us gonna live forever and ain't nobody know when they're leaving. Ain't none of us gonna live forever and ain't nobody know when they're gonna leave. You don't know how you're going to leave even if you put the bullets and the gun to your head. Even if you took the poison, at best you can guarantee it's gonna cause you some harm. You can't guarantee you won't spend the next 20 years in a coma. You can't guarantee you won't spend the next rest of your life paralyzed. Only thing you know for sure is that we're leaving here. We don't know when we're going to leave or by what means. So those three things don't even worry about. They're taken care of for you in advance and in the most permanent and complete way. If you accept and understand that notion, then nobody can make you afraid of death. And then you'll understand why Malcolm said the secret to life is to have no fear. And then you'll understand why he walked in that ballroom that day knowing they were going to kill him. 
he felt standing up and being a man for you as a symbol of that kind of man was worth more than being a wimp and breathing air. And so he went, knowing what the sentence was. He didn't walk into an accidental ambush. Malcolm knew before he got there he was going to die there, and he knew when he walked in for certain he was going to die there. He knew when he walked on the stage it was all over. He knew that. But he made a choice. If I run, my people would have run. If I act frightened, my people would have acted frightened. So I will go and I will raise my hand. He had made up the little game of get your hand out of my pocket. He taught it. He knew exactly what the game was. And he stood there and took the bullets. Took the bullets for you. But like the brothers say, you don't call him Christ. That wasn't crucifixion. Dr. King went to Memphis knowing he would not get out of Memphis alive that second time. It had been told to him. It was made clear to him. He understood he wasn't coming out this time. He knew it. It frightened him a little bit at first, and he went to a downtown hotel, and when certain people prod him, he went on back over to the Lorraine, walking in there, and noticed that the tree that was once in front of his balcony just two weeks ago was cut down. He knew the die had been cast, and he didn't run. He got ready to face them, and he took the bullets for you too, but you don't call that crucifixion. See, we need to understand what parable and allegories mean and what symbols mean. The story of Jesus was never a real historical happening. The story of Jesus is to let you know symbolically what must happen in order for you to declare someone to be the anointed Savior. That's all the word Jesus Christ means. It's the, the anointed Savior. What is it to be anointed? Anointed means to have divine wisdom, a divine understanding, divine knowledge. Divine wisdom and understanding knowledge means to know the truth and know a way to apply it to the, the consciousness of other human beings so they can learn it and use it. Savior simply means you are willing to sacrifice yourself and sacrifice what you've got to do that to exercise and share that truth and that wisdom and that understanding. Ain't nothing bigger about the thing they throwing all the spookism out here that keep you all confused. All of you in this room do something godly, something as an angel at some point in your life. The problem is we're doing it accidentally. It'll be hellified if we start doing it deliberately. But you're all afraid to think like I just discussed. You're all scared to believe that there was no such historical happening as Jesus. The story of Jesus was told in Africa and is written in stone three, four thousand years before Bethlehem was built by another name. God did not wait for a bunch of little white people to invade the Middle East to have his example of a son or daughter come. I mean, if you read the document, Jesus said, we are all the children he said to those brothers following him, you are all the son of God when you behave as I do. So the deal has nothing to do with which vagina you came out of. It had to do with how you behave once you got here. But that isn't the way it's taught in the Pope. Unfortunately, and having had a grandfather who was a minister, who was a good man, who believed like I do. I learned more from him. They kicked my poor grandfather out of the church because they thought he was crazy. But he believed in the practical application of the truth and reality because he was a farmer and he saw God's manifestation every day. He knew if you didn't put any seeds in the ground, you weren't going to get no plants coming out of the ground. He wasn't confused. He knew that once you put it in the ground, if you didn't attend to it with a little care and a little water and a little nourishing, a little love and a little concern, even if it came up, it would die on you. He knew if you didn't prune it and get the grass out and keep enough soil around the roots so the sun didn't kill it, it wouldn't bear no fruit for you. Those were just rules God gave us to use for nurturing and bringing forth the life and up to maturity of all things that has life. Same rules apply to how we rear children. 
Okay, this church is called the Hagia Sophia. This is the first great church of Christianity in the West, the North, the White World. It is the senior church of the Byzantian Empire. This is it today. The Hagia Sophia has been converted to a mosque after Salahuddin and his people took over the Christian world from them. And that's what these, when these minarets was added. It's no longer a church or a mosque at all. It's a museum in Turkey today that you can go and visit. And then we come to the great dog of the time, Constantine, Emperor of Rome, who started what we know as Christianity or white Christianity or Western Christianity. This is the dog that started it, not for the purpose of serving God with all that fantasy that we've been told. He creates this. He brings these Africans and other mixed race people together at, at, at the Nicene Conference. And the people, like I said, seven of, um, uh, of the 10 people who are the initial group that's putting the thing together are Africans. And what he's trying to do, Rome has now conquered all of North Africa and all of what we call as the Middle East, part of Kemet. And so now he needs to find a way to calm the native down. What does he do? How does he create, with this massive empire that they've acquired by war, how do you create a common ideology, a common philosophy, where you can control the behavior of the masses? And that's why modern-day Christianity was created, and that was the intent of Constantine, and he has proven to be enormously successful. Christianity is more successful than the founder ever thought in terms of controlling the minds of human beings using mythology and metaphor out of the very history and anthology of the people he's trying to conquer. And we fell for it because we were forced to fall for it at that time from the butt of the sword and the spear and the arrow and then later by the brunt of the gun. This is a poor painting, but you can see that this is Constantine in the middle and this is four of the black writers of the Bible, and uh, I wish there could be a better painting, but this, this is one of the old renditions. Somebody probably put this together around the 15th century, but it was the Pope before this Pope who was in Cameroon, West Africa in 2009, and the story was carried in um, um, News, I think Newsweek magazine. Um, it was in the spring of 2009, and he said, he was saying he while the Pope was in Africa, he said to the people in Cameroon who was in the stadium that of the 10 people who wrote, who wrote the theology of the church, seven of those 10 were Africans. So you shouldn't run from the church because it's your church. He was doing a hard sell, but the cracker was telling the truth because in order to get what he wanted, he had to tell the truth. And so we knew that. Dr. Ben and others had told us that, but we've heard it now from different sources. Now, this is the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, Bill uh, by the Roman Emperor Constantine on the site believed to be uh, Jesus' tomb. Now, this was not the site of no Jesus' tomb because there was nobody named Jesus to have a damn tomb. But his mother, his mother went to Jerusalem and the mother said that she had found the site where Jesus' tomb was. And so he came and built this church which is this little thing right here. They built the bigger one around it today, but this is the original little temple he built for his mother over what is supposed to be the site of Jesus' tomb. And this is the, of course, the Holy of Holies in that space. And of course, this is the Vatican City um, headquarters in Rome and site of the Catholic religion located in Rome. And in the middle of St. Peter's Square is an obelisk, which is stolen from Kemet, from the front of that great temple in Luxor that I showed you earlier. Now, if, we, if our religion was so profane and our way is so profane, why is this the centerpiece of, the, of St. Peter's Square with a, uh, a, a crucifix of their God sitting on top of this African Tekkenu, mm -hmm. you know? But you have to understand, Vatican City is not a church. It is a nation state, and because all land owned by the Catholic Church everywhere in the world is a part of this nation state. Vatican City is the largest nation state in the world. The Pope is an absolute monarch. The Cardinals makes up his, his parliament and his government. The bishops are his ambassadors. And it goes on and on. They have their own armies. That's called the Jesuits. They have their own secret service, which is called the Black Pope, with their own intelligence network. They have their own currency, their own money, and they have their own banking system in Vatican. So you're looking at the Holy Roman Empire still existing today and is known as the Catholic Church. 
Another look at St. Peter Basilica. This is the inside of the Basilica. This is the Holy of Holies. That's the Holy of Holies from a distance. It's full of things they've stolen from us. And I thought I'd throw this in. This is a statue of St. Peter, the man who was supposed to be working with the teacher that they call Christ. And they got a statue of him, but they got him as a black man with nappy hair. And they change his clothes often on all the holidays. And then this is St. Paul. They got him as a black man with nappy hair. So what, what else are they lying to us about? This is a, a Christ in the Metropolitan Cathedral in Mexico as a black man. This is the black Madonna in Barcelona on, the, on the, the left and the one in Mexico on the right. This is the black Madonna in Lauren, Italy being carried through the streets. And this is the confusion we in. How that happened? Here we are in the Congo carrying some cracker woman around Damn. and the crackers, crackers walking around Spain carrying the black woman around. Oh, Ain't that deep? Damn. Ain't that deep, Damn. black folks? You know, but so we just got to study. We got to learn some stuff, see how people play with us, and then try to play us. Uh-oh. They go Pope Francis, kneeling down with the other Pope, praying to the Black Madonna as they exchange power in the Vatican. And now, where they at? Are they in the basement? That, in that's in the basement of the Vatican. And here goes another Pope, the one before this Pope, the one who died, I think this is John, yeah, praying, John to the black, praying to the Black Madonna in, in the basement. And then here's Pope Benedict um, at a crowd at the shrine of Our Lady of Czestochowa in Poland, the Black Madonna. Oh, man. And then here's Pope John Paul and Our Lady of Vansky in St. Nicholas Church in Kiev, Ukraine. That's deep. And then Pope Francis, who everybody seemed to love, this little uh, father of modern genocide of African people. Take credit for the millions you've killed in the Congo in the name of your Belgian church. You know, Pope Francis and the Black Madonna. When he comes in, they say, we got, we've been lying. Now we got to tell you the truth. Here, worship the black woman. We're giving it to you. So, you know, what, what, what's the deal? What's the deal, black folks? Then and now, ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt, ancient Ethiopia, and today, the European people today. How our stuff has gone from black as black over to white. So how do we take our stuff back? And this is an 18th century painting by a European uh, depicting Mary, Jesus, and Joseph arriving in Egypt during the said festival um, and, and, and the celebration of the birth of the Son of God, Heru, born of Immaculate Conception. So you can see the Egyptians, who they flipped and made the Egyptians white, and then made the servants and the slaves black, and then got the Egyptian worshiping a set and Heru, what we would call the said festival, which was they call Christmas, but it shows them in the forefront coming in with their new idea with the white mother and the white child and the father. This is what's coming into being, and the African worship of the black Madonna and child is going out of being. Uh, Tony Browder gave me this photo. I forgot the name of the uh, artist who did it. And as you can see in the background, the great temple at Luxor, you know. But white folks showing you that they know the truth. They know the truth. They know the black Madonna and child, and they know the said festival, which we, they call Christmas is already being worshipped, and here they come with their rendition of it. And they change the, the, the Egyptian from being black folks, make us slaves, and then make the Egyptian white folks. Crackers are deep. Their deception is, is, is like rogue. You know, these are mental warriors at the highest level. Psychological genociders. And of course, we got St. Maurice, the patron saint of Germany. They don't tell you about Maurice. You don't get no blacker than Maurice. Again, you got St. Maurice with one of their saints. And, and so what I've been trying to show you that what this thing they call Christianity is just stolen black stuff. The thing they call Judaism is stolen black stuff. It's just fragments from the periphery of your system. The thing they call Islam is fragments from the periphery of your system. A good book, by the way, to look at the Islam piece is called El Jahiz. And you can buy it at Barnes and Nobles. It's called El Jahiz. It's one volume 
but in the one volume it has nine small books. It's written in the 8th century Iraq, and the most important book in there is the book called The Superiority of the Black Race Over the White, written in 8th century Iraq. He talks about the Prophet Muhammad as being black. He talks about the companions of the Prophet being black. He talks about one of the black women who were leading the medical corps of Muhammad's army. You got to read this stuff. Or you can read Ibn Khaldun, Philosophy of History, which is written, I guess Khaldun is writing around the um, 10th or 11th century in North Africa. And you begin to see how people just stole our stuff and then come back at us in this exactly abusive manner. What so this the is Africans the end. did when they created the symbols that the Romans mistook for the Holy Mother, God, and Child. It was nothing but a symbol of a man a woman and a child and all the Africans was implying was that all women should be treated like God's mother and that all men should be treated like God and that all children should be treated like the child of the gods this half wit idiot from Europe came in and saw those statues and saw the writings and thought that one woman that the statue represented one woman who had a special kind of happening with God. And when you see the statue in Egypt, he knocked the man off, broke the man off. But they're going to tell us about single parent family and stuff. They create the notion of single parent family right at the root of their religious understanding, which was a misunderstanding of what we left as a message to the future. Imagine what the world would be like if every man respected every woman like she was the mother of God and every woman respected every man like he was God and every man and every woman respected every child like that child was the child of God. You wouldn't even need laws. You wouldn't need police. You wouldn't need government. You wouldn't need all this foolishness that you must only have when morality and ethics and laws have broken down. You don't need these things. And old Lyle say, I think, chapter 64 in the book of the Tao, he says, when people have laws to govern them, ethics and morals have lost their way in governing them. When you need somebody with a gun on their hip to keep you from being uncivil, then you've lost your ability to be civil. But yet you call your civilization, your society, civilization. How could it be civilized when you got prisons, armies, guns, weapons? That is not civilized. But we bought the term, it's civilized. Y'all don't act civilized. When you're civilized, women don't have to worry about being raped in a civilized social order. Children don't have to worry about going hungry in a civilized social order. Men don't have to worry about being unemployed in a civilized social order. So the African especially you who came out here today against this weather and after having met your responsibilities to your family today like going to church and cooking and the things the sisters have to do because sometimes the brothers think they're going to drop dead if they help her cook on a Sunday or something like that you know yeah y'all ought to get real about that you know y'all are just something to be fed if we want our women to be all we know she could be then we need to stop acting like the white man and stop being supremacist against them Oh, but I'm not letting the sisters off the hook. If you want your men to be all that they should be, stop treating them like boys and demanding manhood from them. You don't want to stop rearing these little boys even when they get gray hair. You still want to be mommering them and keeping them little boys. And we understand why. Doing slavery, that was the best way to keep your child alive. Even after slavery, I remember why my parents sent all of my brothers, they got 18, they had to leave South Carolina. Because they know we was big and some of us thought we were bad and that white man would have killed us. So they beat you down as much as they can to kill that spirit in you and if they couldn't kill it all, then you had to leave home. Only those ones who could submit could stay down there. 
So we understand where it comes from, but we got to stop it now. You got to make this man the baddest sucker you can make up. You got to make him the bravest thing you could come up with. Even if you have to dream of some brave notions. You have to make him the most fearless thing in the world no matter how long he lives. Because to live one day as a man is worth living a whole life as what we see on the street out here. Because that's what the bottom line is. God came in the beginning when we came. And there can be no God without you. See, you got all confused. You thought they could um, be no you without God. But some of y'all scared of the way I say that. It don't fit right back into what you've been taught. But the only thing we know about God comes from the mind of a human being. Better listen to that. You don't know nothing about God that did not come from the mind of another human being. You say, well, the Bible is the holy word. Well, that may be true, but some man or woman wrote it down there. <laughs> You say the Quran is divine revelation, that's fine, but somebody wrote it on that paper for you to read and call it divine revelation. Now you may want to ask where they get it from, but they're long gone and you will never really know that piece. That don't mean no disrespect to them, but we need to get real. You need to read the books first of all, before you start killing all of them. Most people we hear shooting their mouth off of defending the Quran and the Bible never read a damn thing in the first place. <laughs> I know it's the truth. I was a Muslim minister for 15 years. One thing I realized about people, once they learned Salam Alaikum, Rahman Tullah, Kif Halik, they didn't want to do nothing else but wear a kufi and carry a rug on their back, make the five prayers during the day, learn the prayers by heart. You know? And when I was a teenager in my father's church down in Georgetown, you know, we used to teach catechism and quarterly classes and everybody just repeat. Who's that? Papa had a thing, you know, you go around the church and he, goes, he had these pictures set up. So he said, who's that? Jesus and the mother. Who's that? Jesus and the father. And who's that? Jesus on the cross. And who's that? Jesus last up until you get to Jesus risen. And then that was the last one, the whole story and pictures. And um, past that, nobody was interested in Jesus. That gave you a little high, a little emotional pop, you know, on Sunday morning. And you learn a few terms about the Garden of Gethsemane and Easter. We all learn about the Golgotha and the place of the skulls. And, you know, we learn that Jesus weep, but we know that Mary went down to the tomb. And then we are told the other Mary went with him, but nobody told us what Magdalena was doing hanging around Jesus so hot and heavy for so long. He ain't told us yet, because everybody's scared to tell the truth that Jesus had the same desire the rest of us had. You imagine if I was to go down here now and give me a basin and start anointing one of you brothers' wives, y'all would beat the hell out of me. <laughs> you sure would. You wouldn't go for it. And you're going to tell me that Jesus has this affection, this anointing relationship with this beautiful woman who preaches, get up in a pulpit and lie and call a whore and a holler. And there isn't one word in any Bible anywhere calling Mary Magdalene a whore or a holler. So why do they insist on telling us she's a whore and a harlot? Only thing that's said in the book is that Jesus cast some demons at the woman. We don't know whether the demon was that she was lying. We don't know whether the demon was that she had a bad cold. We don't know whether the demon was that he didn't go to visit her mother or whatever little bad habit. We assume she was a whore and a harlot. Then Jesus said they spent a lot of time with that whore and harlot. And when all the brothers who had loved him so had abandoned him, that whore was standing at that tomb with full faith and believed that her man was going to rise again. Oh, this is always beyond the money. But unless we understand Magdalene's role, we miss the whole damn story of Jesus. A very important story. Unless you understand the role of the mother Mary, the two people that are always going to be with you to the bitter end is that woman you call your wife, whether you're married by law or not, and that woman you call your mama. Almost anybody else in the world will abandon your butt. Even when the dead body comes home, who going to be the two there dealing with the undertaker? Your brother be saying, well, I ain't got no money. Nigga didn't live right in here. I didn't look up by me when I go out. You know what I'm saying? Your brother's in the lodge, so, but he ain't paid no dues, and you know. <laughs> but you know who's gonna be there? 
that woman, that old woman that brought you here, you're going to say, well, I, I help all the others. I got to do something for this one. It's the last thing I'm going to do. And she's going to get her little money out of her little purse. And she's going to the undertaker. If she ain't got enough money, and say, Mr. So-and-so, you know this my boy here. Yeah? And if you bury my boy, I'll figure a way to get your money to you. And then I'm going to let her do it. And that other lady going to come and say, yeah, well, he, he left home all right, but he was my husband. And she's going to be there with a little veil crying over. Just look at it, and if you think I'm kidding, you've been to enough funerals, you know who's sitting up there. Even if the brother treat the sister bad, throw her out on that day. She'll be there with respect to that corpse. So watch, watch those images in the book. Study the thing. Look at it. It's important you learn the lesson the ancestors meant for you to learn because we are not going to be allowed out of bondage until we go in the way of truth. We are never going to be allowed out of this bondage until we take the right road. We keep slipping off in the wrong path and hell will be our reward. Until we decided that we are going to be the righteous people, that we are going to act like the righteous people, See, you can only be chosen if you act righteous. And any race can be chosen when they choose to act out the role of righteousness. Then you are the chosen one. Just having celebrations and shouting and carrying on and praying and carrying on, that ain't gonna cut it. You're judged by your deeds, not your words. And when we begin to act out the role of lovers of one another, when we begin to act out the role of respecters for one another, when we begin to act out the role of carers for one another, it's your words. And when we begin to act out the role of lovers of one another, when we begin to act out the role of respecters for one another, when we begin to act out the role of carers for one another, no matter what our situation is, when we can respect the homeless and understand how they got there. But for the grace of God, any one of us could be in any shelter on any corner in a split second from this second. Yet what we do is condemn the unfortunate ones who wasn't as strong as us to make it as long as us as if it's not going to happen to us. Somewhere, somehow, if it doesn't happen to you, it's going to be your sister, your cousin, your brother, your child, your grand, your great grand, but God will lay that blight at your door and you're going to have to see it and live with it. No matter how much degrees you got, no matter how much money you got, you look at some of the people that are out there in difficulty, they come from pretty well-to-do black families. Grow up in the church. I, my family was a church. They wasn't no church families like ours. We owned the church. Yet I can't count the junkies. I can't count the crackheads. I can't count the ones that's in and out of jail for not paying child support or for stealing and other things. I can't count the ones who have disrespected the elder people so I feel like killing them. Yes, there's all, there are those ones who've kept to the rule. There are a lot of ones like my brother Andrew who's strong and just seeing the boy kind of family on his back all by himself. And then there's his three boys who I've never heard a distasteful thing from any of the three. And they're all men now. And then there's my little sister Fruity, she's strong. But in there's all of that other stuff and all of y'all got it too. It's not just my family. Every family in this room right now got all them things I just mentioned and more. So we know it's real. But what the brother was saying is that there's a road not taken. The only road we have not taken since we've been in America is the road back to Africa. We've taken every road except the one back to Africa. We tried everything. We've been to yoga and this do and shanga this and we misunderstood this. But the only road truly not taken is to follow our Shango, or to follow our Buddha, or to hear our Oshun, or to listen to our Legba, or to find our way back to Patan, 
but we don't know most of us. I know in this group, some of you surely do, because I know you know those things. But when we were down south, how many people in there was born down in the south? No matter how good that old white doctor was, when things got bad, we had straight for that back path to the root woman house, didn't we? No matter how much praying they did in that prayer meeting for you to be well, we knew the path to the root woman house. But wasn't it a shame that we had to take the back path to the root woman house? See, my grandmother was a root woman. And they made me ashamed of my own mama. Mm -hmm. Ashamed. I remember feeling ashamed. But I didn't live and she didn't live for the day to me to go and tell her I am proud because I understand. But I went ignorantly and said, Mama, did you know? She said, of course I know. You think I'm going to do something I don't know? She knew who she was. She understood when she went to help sick people and took her herbs and roots and polis and leaves and things. She knew she was using medicine out of her historical ancestral past that was going to do some good. And I remember feeling real bad and I remember her telling me, don't feel bad. She said, because I know what I do. Because she said, it, I know what I do. She had my understanding. I have to do what God tell me to do. Post like they say, we can't talk like that now, because that ain't good English. I understood that pretty well. The point I'm trying to make is that everything we are looking for to relieve our pain is already with us. Everything we are looking for to relieve our pain is already with us. The one thing, everything but one thing, the thing that will make us common in the things that are with us, and the one thing that will make us common is an understanding of African history, knowledge, and tradition. If we are not ashamed to practice the Roman way, and we are not ashamed to practice the Jew way, and we're not ashamed to practice the German Lutheran tradition or the Calvinist Dutch tradition or the Anglican Episcopal Baptist French British tradition. <laughs> Why should we be ashamed this, to practice the tradition of the most holy people in the world? You imagine after all the raping and murder and killing and emasculating of the men and <laughs> splitting up of the family by these crackers on the plantation, our women were too high moral, too godly to poison them, even though we had the opportunity and the strength. But there was something about God that didn't allow us to do that. Why can't we build on that strength with an understanding instead of looking at it as weakness, instead of thinking we were scared? People weren't scared. They weren't scared. I used to think they were scared. They weren't scared. And even though I grew up on a plantation, I know we weren't scared. The man could have slaughtered our moss on the road anytime he drove them in the carriage because he knew what he had done. But we are more God than they are, except we think they're more God than we are. And so we imitate them in their ungodliness instead of setting an example with our godliness. We don't need the white man. We never did. We didn't go to Europe. He came to Africa. We didn't go to Asia. They came to Africa. We didn't want to leave our home. God gave us everything we needed. Somebody had to take us, drag us away, kill us. And even then, we brought our way with us. How many people in here are in the Baptist tradition? You don't have to go to church now. I mean, if you were raised in the Baptist tradition, the Methodist tradition, the Catholic tradition. You know, if you go to any of those churches in the white community, and remember, these churches were formed in their culture, you will find one rhythm. 
Rock of ages, sing for thee. Let me go. That's the basic rhythm. Go to one of our churches. You think it's a rap concert. <laughs> In the name of the Lord. One must ask, what is different about those two churches? Is it just that we sing good? Fundamentally, we don't sing any better than white people on par. It's just that what we have to sing and how we sing it and the way we want to see a song is different and maybe different is better. When you go to the Black Baptist Church and you see all that throw down, get down, jump over, and they, I remember when they used to jump benches in my church. You didn't have a good Sunday unless a sister leaped the bench or two. <laughs> Some of y'all remember it too. Y'all just think I'm saying it, you know. You didn't have a good church on prayer meeting night unless you saw a couple of sisters get up and tore down and the other sisters formed a circle around them and they didn't stop and they just kept their hand from stiffening up by keeping it open and they just kept up from bumping into this bench and they let her work it all out. You don't see that in a white church. But you do see that in a Yoruba ceremony. And you do see that in a voodoo ceremony. And you do see that in an Akan ceremony. And you do see that in a Santeria ceremony. And you do see it in a Condom Blake ceremony. But the only other place you see it is in the African American Baptist and Methodist and other Reformed churches that we have, Episcopal and Seventh-day Adventist. You see it there. So since our churches are all a copy of white churches, why aren't we the same? And if we are so different, why are we afraid to acknowledge the difference that we can clearly see? and put a tag on what makes it so different. If our music is so different from theirs, what is different about it then? The only thing that's different about our music is the African things about our music. And the only thing that's different about our church service is the African things about our church service. And if we begin to acknowledge the things that are different in the institutions we share with the European, we will attach our identity back to us without any restrictiveness. Because we are using Africa all the time. We celebrate Christmas and they celebrate Christmas, but look at the way we handle Christmas and you'll see that we always go to this family reunion thing differently than he does. We do it with an African awareness. Now we got his poison too, where we go and says, here we, we go, we, we spend the whole year saving money, because things are tough in the world. So we spend the year saving money, get a nice little nest egg. That can help out if the family, especially if the family pool that little nest egg that everybody got saving that little Christmas club. You can buy a house and set mama up, and each of you took a floor, and the family can live in a communal collective environment, and Go buy your groceries collectively at the market down there instead of going to a supermarket and go buy your case of collard greens and two cases of chicken and put it in your big freezer in the basement of your house and you never want for nothing. But what do we do? We save up all that money, work hard. Then Christmas comes, we give it back to the white man. We said we hate so. So he could go buy that house and him and his children and stuff living there and that he could buy that freezer and he can go to the market, get the fresh food and store it in his house to take care of his family. While we stay in his roach infested, ragged, two-bit tenements that he keeps because we have become what old people used to call fools. You know he fool, you know. Meaning you don't know what's happening. Meaning you've lost your way. Meaning you don't trust God. Meaning you no longer trust yourself. Meaning you don't love your children. Meaning you don't love yourself. Meaning you don't love your race. Meaning, of course, you don't love God. Primarily, all these things exist because we are fundamentally ignorant about what God is. See, because if you love God, you can love yourself. And if you love yourself, you can love others. But you can't love others unless you love yourself. And you can't love yourself unless you love God. And you can't love what you don't know. And so we're caught not knowing God. So when we even paint pictures of God, we paint the reflection of our enemies as pictures of God. 
when we reach the buyer picture of God, we buy reflections of our enemies as pictures of God. This is an even greater sign that we hate God. We hate God so much we make God look like our enemy. And not understand that we're doing that. Everybody know that these people are our enemies. But he's got us so confused that he tells us that you are a racist. Because you say, I hurt you when I hit you over the head with a baseball bat. You go, I don't want to be a racist, but maybe it really didn't hurt that much. You damn right it hurt. And not only am I racist, come here a minute. Let me borrow your pistol and blow his brains out. But you think that would be committing a sin, wouldn't you? But of course, when they came in the garden to get Christ, was Peter not wearing a sword? And I held this passive stuff. Jesus was a peaceful man. Why in the heck was Peter doing wearing that sword? He chopped the centurion ears off, according to the book, right? This is Peter, man. What is Peter doing wearing a sword? If Peter was wearing the sword, the implication is all the rest was wearing swords. But of course, it's also in the book, according to Father Lawrence Lucas. I hadn't had a chance to ask Father, where's that chapter? But I, I know Lawrence Lucas don't lie. <laughs> Where, on Good Friday, Jesus asked the brothers, and I'm sorry, Palm Sunday, how much money you have among you? And they tell Jesus how much money they have among you, among themselves. And Jesus say, how many weapons, how many swords you have among you? And they told him, and Jesus said, take all the money and go buy as many swords as you can. Then how, why are we saying the things we are saying? Why are we approaching life in the manner we are approaching life and say we're imitating the master of life when the master had no such approach? The poorer you were, the more downtrodden you were, the closer to you Jesus got. Here we are saying we're Christ-like and the poorer a person is, the more downtrodden is, the farther away from them we get. I'm using Jesus because that's the symbol of deity that you use. There's nothing but a symbol of deity. For my personal self, I would use Ola Dumiri. I would use Oshun, who's my favorite friend. Like when me, we just partners, because I like the Jess, and I like the Josh, and I like the tease, and I like the trick a little bit, and I like to realize how to move people from the crossroads, but at first they have to enjoy the intensity of being at the crossroads. So this is the end of the presentation, but I just wanted to open a door that we can engage in another kind of dialogue. So even with our brothers and sisters who are in the churches, um, we can approach them in a different way. I think um, we need to move away from this abusive, attack, antagonistic approach and try to find common ground using our history to bring our people back to the original uh, format, to the original thesis, to the original presentation of, of the wisdom that our ancestors have put together. Because the majority of our people are in these Christian churches, they're in these temples. If we say we are freedom fighters, we can't, who are we liberating? You know, whose freedom are we fighting for? Because the handful of us who are doing this teaching, we can't lead the, the, the more than two billion Africans. We've got to try to get them to understand their reality, to understand their history. 